All right, everybody, welcome. Uh, this is Fighting the World with Wistrick and Bruce. Uh, that would be me, Wistrick. And me, Bruce. There you go. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about scenarios. Uh, in general, what is there, why is there, and how can it be better? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Bruce, go ahead, do the intros. We can plan <laughs> right. this one out as thoroughly as we did last time. So we have <laughs> we have four panelists with us tonight, and they were picked from a variety of kingdoms to kind of show a little bit more of a spread about um, from, ranging from small events, uh, smaller melee events, to larger melee events like both wars and Penzik. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves first, but uh, in in order across the top here. Um, <laughs> just to make sure that everyone gets their fair shake at an introduction. So I'm going to let them take it away and please don't make your boasts more than like five minutes. Let's start with uh, Peter Grau from the Midrealm. Hello, Peter Grau from Bremen. <laughs> I was Midrealm General for Rapier for Appendix 43 and 44. Uh, I was Lieutenant General for Rapier under Adam McKay for the two Appendix before that and started out in unit command, worked up through regional and then into kingdom level. Um, yeah, been doing this for what, 12 years now? <laughs> Give or take. All right, uh, next we're gonna go over to Oliver Dogberry from Kai. Hello, I'm Oliver Dogberry. Uh, <laughs> I love melee. It's one of the things I really enjoy about this uh, sport that we do. Um, I've been Fencing since 2004, I've been starting designing scenarios about 2007, 2006. Uh, out here on the West Coast, uh, we have a baronial war called Petrero in May that uh, is about 2,200 people, 2,200 people down here who also attend uh, Australia and Great Western War. Uh, and I enjoy breaking down the scenarios into their little pieces. I have a scenario one-on-one -on -one class that I teach, right? Literally just break everything down and give all the different things that you can do to build scenarios back up from that. Excellent. All right, uh, next up we have Warwick from Ontier. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I've been playing for uh, over two decades. Um, I used to be a fringe player. Um, uh, and in, the, in those two decades, uh, I'm also a game designer, a professional game designer. It's what I do for a living. Um, I've shipped like 50 million titles, 50 million units or something. So I've been doing it for a long, long time. And I bring that to designing scenarios and I bring that to uh, deconstructing scenarios when I'm in them. Um, and I guess, uh, every, you know, my, my lineage uh, can't match these Penzik generals at all. Um, but as a, as a fringe fighter, what, one year, we put together all the mercenaries at one of our largest events, which was about 60, um, and took on the royalists um, and royally whooped them. That sounds like a lot of fun. All right, and then last but not least, Hawk, who will hit me if I use her full name, from Trimeris. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hawk. Uh, I have a full name, uh, Miriam de Hawk Trimeris. Nobody calls me that, everyone just calls me Hawk. Much easier. Um, Oh God, lineage. Uh, I've served as general for Trimeris, both at Gulf Wars and Penzik, both other random little events. Um, my household, the wandering turnip farmers, if you've ever seen us, we show up at a couple of Atlantean events and somehow they put me in charge because they're crazy people and I talk a lot. Um, I'm currently co armicking with Wistrick the uh, Gulf Wars. I've been doing that for two years, year and a half or two years, depending how we want to count it since this year was canceled and deputy before that. Um, and just stepped down as Kingdom Rapier Marshal for the Kingdom of Trimeris as well. I think that's everything I've done. And I stab people sometimes. <laughs> so I get to be very involved in the Gulf Wars setting up of melees and, and the, all the background of that. So that's kind of my expertise side of that. She also has a penchant for name tags, so be careful this is right up at one of her wars. Um, just a note for anyone who has their video on or their mic unmuted, we are recording. Um, we currently have uh, been asked by the society social media officer whether or not they can share this. So if you have any issues with that, please turn off your um, 
your camera. All right. <laughs> Wistrick, anything else to add before we get going? Um, no, just uh, uh, as we do get into this, uh, shall we jump to the first question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, so the first thing we really want to pick apart between Kaid, Tremeris, Antir, and Midrealm is what does a standard melee scenario look like in your kingdom? The most either run of the mill or the most run thing that you do at your big melee event. And I, we kind of want to delve into the why, um, why it looks that way. Why is that good for your region? But first, let's go with a quick like description of what a standard melee event or um, melee scenario would look like, um, whether it's for the mid realm, our war camps, or for uh, like Trimeris, one of your regular summer events, not Penzik, not Gulf Wars. All right, so let's start with Hawk on that one. So um, Trimeris, for those who don't know, is the kingdom. It's State of Florida without the hand pan, uh, panhandle. So as we say, itty bitty living space. It's not a very large kingdom, um, either geographically. It's long and narrow and yes. Um, it, it's not a very large kingdom, either geographically or population wise. We don't really have that many very, very large population centers. It's not the Northeast. We've got five, six baronies. It's kind of small. So we don't actually end up with that much in kingdom melee just because we don't really have the population to support it. You know, if we have 20, 30 fighters show up at an event, that's a really big event for us in terms of our rapier fighters. So most of our melee ends up taking place. We do a musketeers tournament each year, which the format has changed, but it's some version of a number of participants, usually based on points, different points being uh, for different ranks, if you have in rapier. You can have a limited number of points to make as many people or as few people on the field as you want. And we've recently started trying to push scenario-based, um, more scenario-based melees on that as opposed to just a line battle, which is often what happens. So things like, you know, making it a bridge and limited front engagement, or so making a flag that you have to go hold and timing it, because that's what we tend to see at golf boards. So that makes it a slightly more accurate practice for golf boards, which is our really big melee event. All right, thank you, Hawk. Oh. oh, that's my voice. <laughs> All right, um, we're gonna jump over to Oliver. <laughs> uh, what does a typical scenario, melee scenario, look like in your kingdom? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. You have to push the button. <laughs> I mute myself so I don't make weird noises. Uh, <laughs> When so we don't hear you make weird noises. Well, those, that's different. That's, that's usually accompanied with beer. Um, the noise is in your head. Yes. So the difference between East Coast, West Coast, I think primarily is the length of the events. Uh, on the East Coast with Penzik and Gulf Wars, you have a multi-week uh, event so you can spread things out and have a given day, a single melee type set up. Uh, with Petrero War, Estrella, and Great Western Wars, those are less than a week or about a week long. And the fighting days are usually two to three days of fighting. So we try to cram everything into a day as much as possible. We'll start at 10 o'clock and we'll finish by four and we'll do melees all day long. And so what we try to do is give a, a smorgasbord of everything you can think of. We, I like to start with a warm up, kill them all warm up, and end with a last man standing, last Spencer standing, um, res battles, and everybody gets enough fighting. And in between, we do everything from open field to hay bill city castles to capture the flags. We try to get a little bit of everything so that everybody has a chance to either just go out and play or strategize if that's the type of game that they like to play. And I muted myself, so I wouldn't make weird noises. <laughs> All right, thank it you. Make feel good. <laughs> yeah, just for you. Um, that's some excellent perspective, especially from a kingdom that isn't as um, hands in all the pies when it comes to Gulf Wars or Penzik or multi-week events. Uh, next, we're going to jump over to the Mid-Realm, which is another large uh, melee kingdom. 
Uh, Peter, take it away. Yeah, because we, we have what we refer to as war season. It's basically once events starts happening out, out, outside again in the spring that runs through Penzik. And most of those will have at least some melee scenarios to play. A lot of the time they'll be based on what we expect to be doing at Penzik more general early in the season and getting more and more dialed in as we get closer to war. And we know for sure what the scenarios are going to be because we have regional commanders that are in each of the states that comprise the Mid-Realm. Each of them are in charge of taking care of organizing those practices at their events, working with the marshals in charge. So they'll be doing anything that we'll be seeing on the field of Penzik. So there's a lot of practicing the whole open field, kill them, kill them all kind of fights where, you know, half the time it turns into the tidy bowl of death. Um, there's a lot of reviewing and practicing how to safely do both sides of limited fronts, like a kill pocket or a doorway. Um, there's a lot of warm ups and training drills that we do that start off with like fox and hounds, you know, two on one fights, and then growing that into three on fives and kind of talking about how to expand those ideas. So we try to mix up practice and fun and learning new stuff all at the same time. I have been on the wrong end of foxes and hounds too many times. It's so much work fun end. <laughs> right end, fun whatever end. you call it. <laughs> All right, and last but not least is Warwick from um, Ontier. All right, thanks. Uh, so we we're a really really big kingdom. Uh, it would take you thirty two hours to go end to end, top to bottom, uh, no stopping for peas. Um, and so that that's a double edged sword. It means there's always something, every weekend there's something you can do. And um, because we're the Pacific Northwest, we don't get a lot of snow. And so we have a very long season. And so we actually, we have a lot of wars. We do a ton of wars here. We have a ton of outdoor camping events. Uh, a, you know, at, at minimum an event will be two days. It'll be just the weekend. But um, we have a lot of long weekends as well. We're also American Canadian and we get a lot of cross border, mostly Canada going down to the States. Um, a lot of Americans don't seem to have passports, but Canadians all do. So we head down the I-5 and there's a lot of great stuff to do down there because the population is very, very high. But we are also primarily a tourney kingdom. So even though we love camping, like our camping events are amazing and massive, and thousands of people come to our events, um, our wars are really glorified tournaments. <laughs> and so um, that's realistically what they are because it's a culture of heroes um, and uh, whether it's a on the heavy field or whether it's on the rapier field, you, what you have is this, um, this back and forth, this pull, this push pull uh, polarization between uh, people that want to go out there and be heroes and have that one on one experience and stand out and be a cowboy and the people who are designing the scenarios who want to gamify things, who want to tell a story, who want that narrative, who want a multitude of different types of experiences. They want to see push battles. They want to see people fighting at the gates. They want to have scenarios that branch given what happened on the previous uh, uh, scenario. Um, and then you've got a whole bunch of people that really just want to find somebody to stab. Um, and, and sort of making all that work uh, can be very, very challenging for the people that are running it. Um, it's exciting and it's fun. And I used to think we were great at it until I started traveling. Uh, it's, it actually sounds like fun. Um, it's, it's a really good time. I mean, everyone's <laughs> out there to have a really, really good time. But the, there's, uh, there are people, the, the people who are running these things, like myself, you try to add depth. Um, but as soon as you add depth, you add complexity. And once you add complexity, a lot of people get a little lost, right? And so that's a challenge. Oh boy, uh, you see, you see Peter nodding. You see me nodding. Uh, the Mid Realm Army can definitely, definitely identify with that, on a couple of levels. Um, so this is basically we've we've talked about standard scenarios, and we've ranged here from like preparing to wars to cramming in all the fun in one day to finding scenarios that speak to the the hero in us all. I'm gonna open this question to the entire floor of panelists, just real quick. What is the worst scenario that you have ever run in your kingdom and why? Oh, can I answer that right off the bat? Please, please do. I, I, I had to make a snap decision on a scenario we were going to run because the conditions wouldn't let us run it. So I made up a new scenario on the spot, which was immediately, immediately gamed by the people in the scenario. Don't do that. 
and I'm not talking about the people gaming the scenario. I'm talking about the 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 MIC that made up a scenario on the spot. Just don't do that. Worst. What do you, uh, so what do you mean by games the scenario? Can you give us an example? So, uh, when yeah, I what was the scenario? Yeah. I try to create win conditions, right? I don't want people to just line up and just go to the last man standing. Those can be fun, but that's a, it's a really easy thing to do and you can do that anywhere. So uh, typically when I run scenarios, there's a narrative and you want win conditions and you want people to think about it. You want to create situations where the tactics inform the strategy. And so when you do that without, without pre-planning, without being able to at least paper test it, you're, you're almost guaranteed that somebody's smarter than you or better at you than deconstructing these things or had more time to think about it because they're in the middle of it is going to find a hinge that they can use to take advantage of the rule set at which point you pretty much got to scrap it or uh, uh, people start getting upset and now now nobody's having fun and so don't that's not a, that's not what you want to do so so adding on to that gaming the rules isn't necessarily always a bad thing it's bad when you don't plan for it so I'll admit, like, when I create scenarios, I literally have a, a crew of people who are really, really good at finding the loopholes. And I go, how would you break this scenario? Am I okay with that? Yes, I can say that. That's great. Sure, break the scenario by taking the chest and hiding it in the back. I'm cool with that. Take the scenario by setting the chest on fire. Nope, I'm not cool with that. That's not going to be allowed. Let me write that in the rules. Um, my, my worst scenario wasn't local, but it was Gulf Wars and was kind of the same situation where just because of safety conditions, what was supposed to be the ravine battle turned into something completely else. Um, most of the time I thought of two years ago. Um, and I made, I made a double mistake. Um, one was that I, I didn't have time to test it beforehand. And two was that someone offered to set it up and they did. And then I showed up and I went, oh, crap they didn't think a couple of things through can we fix this no wait we don't have room it was just kind of like the everything bad came together at once and it turned into like an injury fest of sadness and doom and despair and mud brawl someone just posted in the uh, chat that's a great name for it and that's what i'm going with it was a mud brawl um and we ended up like we literally ended up halfway through going nope we're stopping we're not doing this anymore someone's going to end up in the hospital. We're not doing this. It, it needs to stop. And that was, that was not like, I have nightmares about that thing. It was not a pretty situation in any way, shape or form. It, having, having been there and participated in that, it was absolutely just the ultimate combination of bad weather, bad terrain, uh, and not quite it, flying by the seat of all of our pants. Cause I remember, okay. I remember the, the Marshall call beforehand as well. So it, it happens. And that's kind of why we want to have this discussion on how we can improve making the games. All right. Other uh, especially as somebody who's going to be in charge of scenarios at Gulf Wars. In the, in the I have no idea what you're talking about. This is not, I don't like this, whole thing, a deputy. this whole series is not entirely self-serving at all. <laughs> oh, you already confirmed this last week too. I did. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I was involved in, the, the least fun scenario I've ever participated in uh, was also a last minute change. The battlefield staff for Penzik was supposed to have been able to provide the MacGuffins to be carried around, the, the, the thing to carry to the, to the point to score with. And nothing actually materialized out of that. So the marshal in charge said, ah, it's cool, I'll just grab some pillowcases at Walmart and it'll be fine. I'll throw some sand in so it'll blow away. And they somehow decided that what we wanted to have was large items, basically like a hay bale, where it took two people to really pick it up and carry it. And if one person's dead, it's not going anywhere. Um, so the battle pace was supposed to be regulated by the restrictions of the items. And instead, we had these two-pound bags with a nice long handle, and that turned into what we now call sprinting the war point. Oh, uh, I um, remember that one. It might be the same smoked one. Because this, there have his been a couple of East um, is really, really fast, and uh, yeah. Benjamin. I, I never, I never made it to contact with the, with the opposition before the fight was over, 
before they had gotten mo enough points back to their score point that it, the game was over uh, because it was literally sprint in, grab it, and keep and run back to your run back to your res line. There were a lot of things that were not intended to be done that way, and last-minute changes that weren't clarified turned it into nope, run, 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 and game over, and it was awful. I uh, I still remember that one. I wa I remember watching Atlantia just swoop in from the side, ma namely Benjamin. It uh -huh. was Benjamin. It was all Benjamin. And a very young Boris and Kalen uh, were just like, <laughs> "You three, go. We'll catch uh -huh. up." Mm -hmm. And I was I was commanding one of our our because I was back in Atlantia then, well, commanding one of the groups. And yeah, it was that thing like I'm ch trying to chivvy every, everybody up there, and I get up there. And there's nothing to do, like everything. Yeah, it's game over. All done. Yeah. I think yeah, for me, there were like five people. It was game over in about 23 seconds. The worst scenario, I didn't design it. It was at Australia. They had the Aitenvelters and their allies inside the castle. And everybody else on the other side was lined up like a line at Disneyland trying to get into the one gate which was a massive kill pocket. It was an unlimited res and unlimited RBG shots. And so we were lined up trying to get to be one of the few people that were up at the front at the kill pocket. People died at the kill pocket had to go back through our line that was waiting there. Meanwhile, they were firing RBG shots at people at random in this massive line outside who couldn't do anything. And it was a very unsatisfying scenario because it took me an hour to get up after dying three times to the kill pocket. I never quite made it to the kill pocket before they ended the scenario. Oof, that does not sound fun at all. Uh, wish... Unlimited res, like limited front engagements are just one of those that like, that, that doesn't work for rapier. So um... I usually use unlimited stuff to start. Mm -hmm. So people can get their yayas out, they get a sweat on, Right, if, you, if somebody showed up with 300 shot, it's like, yeah, you'll get to shoot him, right? And all that stuff, and then you get serious. And, and yeah, you that's what we use, like, use La Rochelle for at Penzik. So yeah. It would have been fine if there's more than just racks. one gate with five people being able to, do, to play. But an hour of just five people at oh. a time, everybody else went in line. Duck. I have a memory of a battle like that at Penzik where it was a, basically a field battle and you got some number of hay bales that you could, you know, construct yes. something. Yep. And uh, whatever this side one, I was fighting on. This one came up two weeks ago also. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I was fighting it's just on. just one of those hallmarks of like, the other this side. Is and my our, our memory team decided to take over and pop. built our plan for us. We wanted to offer a nice invitation to make it easy for the East to come in and try to, try to drag us out. And instead she wanted to build a perfect kill shoot. And she did. And it was just, we just stood there until the marshals made us get out of our fort and get slaughtered because we were horribly outnumbered. And that was, but like looking at that scenario design just in the, the book, you mm -hmm. can see that that was gonna, that was what was gonna happen. We yeah. didn't expect a queen to take over and be a tactical genius for us. I, I will say that, that that's the one thing you can almost never plan for is what is the crown going to do? Yup. Because they have a tendency to, with all love and respect to the crowd, they have a trump card, and some of them will play it with or without, um, with or without listening to advice about why this trump card may not be a smart move, in whatever way. Mm -hmm. In that case, technically, it's a smart tactical move. In terms of an enjoyment move, it's not a smart move. Well, so we we've, we've touched on a couple of things here with with as we lovingly have called it in our very super secret awesome planning notes, the suck. Um, it, and it seems to range from people breaking the rules, whether it be royalty or participants or MICs, to bad scenarios in general, like why would you come out of the building if you don't need to come out of the building? Or why would they go in the building if they don't need to come in the building? Or MacGuffins with track stars. Um, or just bad terrain, bad luck, bad weather in general. Um, so what can we do 
to make melee better? So I think the first question we're going to ask to kind of crack into this tough nut is why are there so many freaking line fights in rapier melee in our scenarios? All right. I saw Oliver's hands go together like this. I, Warwick's raising his hand. Let's start with Oliver, because I saw him do the uh first, and then we'll jump to Warwick. The problem with, with having a lot of line fights is either you have way, way too much open field, or more likely, you have too little open field, and people don't have any other choice except to stand side by side. There's There's no terrain to, or obstacles to break it up. There's no options to go around. And you just simply sit there and go, well, um, there's no way to, to, to go around the backside of anybody. We cannot, like the armored side does, just smash through the line. Uh, so we, we have very limited options with that. Uh, but that, to me, it's, it's a terrain sizing issue. So I don't have a lot more to add to that, actually. Um, if, uh, I, I don't. I think. I think what you want is a bigger field than a smaller field, because a smaller field they will. Uh, if you're if the first, the first mistake is saying we're going to have an open field battle because that will naturally become a line battle. People will line up, and if all you say is it's an open field battle, then that's what's going to happen. And if it's a small field, they will expand to the edges because they don't want to be flanked. Um, and in Ontario, we always use death from behind. Um, and so flanking and getting behind is, is very desirable. Um, and so people want to do it. They're going to want to punch through if they can, or sorry, we ooze through um, if possible. Or, or they want to flank and get around. Um, but if it's a small field, they will expand right to the edges so that won't happen to them. And now what you have is a series of duels. Um, and if it, your strategies become more limited at that point. So if you want to have, if you don't want to have line battles, you, uh, you take a look at the number of people you've got, make sure your field is large enough that they can't actually spread out to that point. Because if they try and there's not enough of them, people are just going to walk through the line. And so now, now you're in a skirmish scenario. Um, or uh, if you want to make that more interesting, you just make, you make secondary goals, right? You, you make the win conditions, not last man standing. So a line battle is fine as long as the, the condition, the win condition isn't last man standing. Because especially in Ontario, that just means you're going to have 40 people dueling. So yeah, we were going to have a follow on question that you just kind of laid into. Oh, um, um, I'll, I'll add yeah. on to that from the all mix side of it. The one thing about field battles is they're easy in terms of setup, in terms of people understanding the rules, in terms of it's traditional. This is what we always do. It, I mean, a field battle is you show up, you fight each other. And I feel like that's part of why it shows up so much, at least to Golf Wars. I know Wistrick and I have talked about ways to, well, what can we do to improve it? Um, but I think that's possibly why they show up but from, a, from an armic point of view. Because with all the love in my heart, while I love scenarios, like great town scenarios, that have little buildings that don't look like a D&D battle, um, like with all the love of my heart, that is a solid hour of usually the marshals hauling around hay bales and begging people to help and hauling around giant rope. And yeah, it, it, it is hard. Um, not that we're not glad to do it, but flying battle is, it is the easiest version. You can do it with nothing. And I think you're right. People kind of expect it, right? It's like, where, when, when yeah. are we doing open field battle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tradition. Yeah, I, I think I sorry. Actually, I think there's one more speaker. I have something to add, but I think somebody else. There's at least there's only three of us spoke. Yeah, it's a growl from the mid room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think there was there was a comment in the in the text chat. I didn't catch who it was from. Virgil was to, was right in a lot of ways. Um, that one of the limitations of rapier is that everybody's blades are within about a foot of the same length. And everybody's arms, with a few exceptions, Simone, it's everybody's arms are within about a foot of the same length. So the most range difference differential we're going to end up with to push lines around is really going to be maybe two feet. So it's really hard to create pressure points that way. 
and to force force your 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 generals your or your local commanders to make decisions that create hinges in a line or gaps in a line other than just simply piling on and pushing and trying to get people to make dumb have dumb ideas but we don't really have a lot of the tools that armored has to force things to go differently may i address that no sorry wrong simone i was i was sorry valbran uh Valbrander, yeah yes yeah. he's, he's, <laughs> he's in my backyard right <laughs> so i'm excited by uh, i have to be honest when i first saw the spears i didn't like them mm -hmm. but when i think about the spears and I didn't like them because uh, while I trust many of my brothers and sisters with a metal uh, sword on the end of a stick, um, when you get into large melee situations, there's a whole bunch of people that are there on spring break that I don't necessarily trust in the same situation. So phasing those out and bringing in the rubber tips, I think is great. And I also like what they did with the bows. Um, because the reason the bows didn't really work before was because they said, we're going to use 30 pound bows and heavy ammo and most and i've shot rapier fighters with my 30 pound bow because i do come at archery mm -hmm. on the heavy field and they're like no i don't want i don't want that to happen again right, right. but they pardon me they've dropped the poundage down to 20 with the same ammo and what that means is you can bring in heavy combat archers onto the rapier field just authorize them in combat archery or whatever or more if they want and now you have something that can offset the spears so if you've got people that there with spears you're going to have rapier fighters with shields and then you're going to have to bring in the missiles to take out the spears. Now, suddenly, a line battle becomes way more interesting. Yep. So that, I think, is going to change things, if you can get the numbers. If I, could. I think, in, indeed, with the spears, you might even get some heavy fighters coming out and trying to play that, you know, sort of like playing a little farm league hockey when they're in the pros. They might come out and just try to get a little ice time kind of thing. Sorry, that's a Canadianism, but I'm sure <laughs> you guys got it. Yeah, some of us are close enough to the border. Um, we, we have a hockey team somewhere in Mertiers. <laughs> um, so we, we've kind of talked a little bit and touched on this with this question. Um, why do we focus so hard on tradition? Um, why do our typical scenarios really look the way they do? Um, why do we, I, I know that one of you mentioned you try to pack in an entire day or like an entire war in one day. So you do the line battle, you do the, you do a couple of scenarios, you, you do everything on top of that. What would change that? Would it be these new rules? Would it be the spheres? Would it be timed res until everyone figured it out? Um, I'm going to open it to the entire panel for this. I'm not going to go one by one. Um, so feel free to chime in if you have an answer. Actually, I'll, if I, I'm going to go back and, and talk to Warwick's point. Um, back in 2008, we did a three-year spear experiment with metal spears with her, I, it was me and the, her ladyship, Mayala Campbell and, of Kaid. Um, and after three years, it was put up to the, to the society level and put into the rule set. So we have been playing out here with the metal spears for over a decade. And yes, they do add a strategy and tactic difference to the battle as, as you would with either archery or RBGs. The difference is unlike uh, archery and RBGs, you don't lose your ammo with the spear. Uh, and so you have that second rank weaponry that we have been lacking. And it, it's amazing what it can do to a kill pocket or a doorway or a bridge to sit there and do that. It's, it is a great and wonderful thing. And um, perhaps we're a different kingdom, but you know, between Australia, Petruro and Great Western War, we've not really had any problems in over a decade with the metal spears. It's, it's like if you're going to wield it, you you become authorized in it, and if you can't do it right, you don't get to play with it. Why do so, you think they're Why do you think they're phasing them out? Um, we want to get to that right now. Uh, that's another five-hour discussion. Right, that's, um, that's not honest. It's it's a fear of them, uh, much like when we first came out with the schlagers and the heavy. I heard the same complaints because I came in just as Epis and Foils were leaving and we had the heavy 
rapier blades come out and what I heard is, oh my God, you're gonna kill somebody with that. I will not step on the art and the melee field with, with those out there because you will hurt someone. And that was the attitude back then with our big thing that we now do as standard. And the same thing with cut and thrust. The cut and thrust was not allowed to go into melee because, oh my God, you're gonna kill somebody with those things. And the same with the metal spears. We have had, we had one incident where uh, we had a line charging in, the guy put the butt of the spear on the ground. This was our first year of the experiment. And we realized that you cannot plant a spear. After that, we had almost zero. And we also had cuts and, and tip cuts, line, uh, pull cuts in there. It, a lot of what we did was, was hamstrung by society Earl Marshall that he took stuff out, which made them less effective and less useful all around. Um, and I think it's just a fear of them and not knowing them. I brought them out to Gulf Wars and I got lambasted and chewed at uh, for, for bringing them out. People just really hated them. It's almost an East Coast, West Coast thing. Um, and by and part, I don't know why. We, we embraced them. I'm glad we did because now that there's the, the rubber ones, um, it, it is a stepping stone to that. Uh, the, the KRM list was having both, the rule set was supposed to have both of the spears, metal and rubber, and they went up to society and it was taken, the metal ones were taken out at the last minute, not by the Earl or the uh, Society Rapier Marshal. Um, uh, and and it, it would, if it was left in, my point is you leave both sets in, each kingdom can decide that they either want both, one or none and we leave it to the kingdom to make that decision rather than edict it down from society to remove what has been really for over a decade in use and practice safely. Um, but I didn't want to get into that. That's like I said. That's, <laughs> I, I'm glad you did actually. That's, that's it's good to know and I'm sad for you. Yeah, it's like I said, there's a, it's a, it's a lot longer and a lot more beer is needed for some of that. Um, we may have an episode planned about <laughs> like At least on the list of like suspected Somewhere topics. <laughs> what, what was the original <laughs> question? I think we <laughs> sidetracked. Um, there's somebody okay. mentioned that spears, uh, the, the buried ranges, uh, help to make line battles more uh, interesting. Yes. Okay. Was the question how do we make them more? I, I can't remember what the original. I think was. yeah, the original starting point on this was kind of we field battles. The general yeah. thing, not just spears. How do we make field battles not just the Line same battle. thing over and over oh, again? It, it, we're going so, back to having the same actual scenarios over and over again. I think a lot of it is people just say, this is what worked last year. We're just going to do it again. Um, and it sometimes gets falls into a fallacy as it's worked before. Why change it? Mm -hmm. The other big thing that I've run into with the scale of marshalling, marshalling Penzik is that simply convincing people to do something different and to understand a new scenario is really, really hard. Um, I think most people that have, that have spent much time at Penzik have probably run into a marshal who didn't read the rules and will just simply come back with a ruling of that's how we've always done it. Not just uh, Penzik. Hmm? I don't think that's just, a, I don't think right, that's yeah, probably that's not just, just Penzik, but especially Penzik. I've met a lot of marshals that didn't from, know the rules, or yeah. they're still operating off rules from 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, this, it's so hard to institute change there just because there's so much institutional inertia. And inner kingdom uh, anthropology takes a big hit, too. Well, I think another problem, another issue with this is if you have an MIC, so most of the MICs are fighters. And so you've got somebody that's chosen not to fight to MIC. And you're like, yay, we have an MIC. That's fantastic. And for us in Ontario, like we don't have uh, two or three ginormous wars. We have, we have a giant kingdom. And so we fight ourselves. We fight, our baronies fight each other. We have a ton of baronies. We have a lot of shires. And so we have a lot of set wars that happen within our massive kingdom. And so you're just, you just want somebody to run it, mm -hmm. right? And so the safest and the easiest thing to do, as you said, is to do the same thing you did last year because that's what worked. It was safe. People had a good time. We'll do that again. And when you get people that step up and say, you know, I want to do something a little bit different, often there's resistance to that. 
Uh, and so I think that's one of the major problems that people need, need to deal with. And the reason there's resistance to it is because you've got somebody that comes in, maybe with a gaming background, um, but maybe, maybe they actually haven't thought things through and people have experience with that. And they're like, you know, the last time somebody came in and brought in a whole bunch of gimmick stuff, it really sucked. So I don't want to do that. I just want my bridge battle. I want my line battle. I want my push battle because I know that's going to work and no, there'll be no crying afterwards. So someone actually brought up a good point in the chat, which um, Stuart Waven said, you know, Trisha line battle, for those of us who've been fighting, you know, 10, 15 years, yeah, it's something that we've done every bloody year, blah, blah, blah. But for a newbie, a line battle is kind of a nice safe place for them to start. Like it, it is beneficial to a newbie because they have, it's easy for them to understand. It's an easy battle. You're fighting in a line. You've got your nice little group, you know, to fight with. Yeah, you're there so with your brothers and sisters backing you up, right? You're right. That's a really good point. They're there. You're there in that team environment. And that's actually a really positive thing. I think that's a great point, Hawk. I remember yeah. my first Pinzik and I was, I couldn't do anything for see anything on the battlefield except there's people across from me i'm gonna go kill them yeah and it was it was a blast yeah those open field battles are a lot more fun for the sort of rank and file fighter than they are for the commander as a general it's awful like you're you get one chance to sort of influence the flow of the battle by talking to your commanders ahead of time and then it just explodes and who knows what's going to happen and if I, you're outnumbered you're just outnumbered there's no force multiplier there like i would are you the worst general ever that you accepted battle on these terms? But <laughs> the last time that I was general for the Gulf Wars field battle, I had, I had some pretty strong um, commanders of the various kingdoms. And literally our, our planning went like this. Okay, we're going to line up like this. Don't put Elthamok next to Atlantia because, you know, Elthamok walks and Atlantia runs. Got our lineup. Okay. If they push this side, we'll go like this. If they push the other side, we'll go like this. If they push the middle, we'll go like this. Everyone good? Great. Let's go. And that was literally the extent of our planning for that. Because that there's not standard. really much more you can do. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds pretty standard. It's right, you know, you gotta trust your commanders and give them give them an opportunity to make decisions. You you explain to them the strategy and you let them decide on the tactics, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I wanna go back to talking about adding secondary goals. Mm -hmm. Um with and and sort of what are some uh, some examples of secondary goals that you can add for a field battle to make it beyond what we what we've been discussing to make it change from a line fight and peter your comment actually uh inspired a thought can those secondary goals um serve as a effective force multiplier theoretically they can if you can get people to understand them <laughs> I know that sounds snarky, but it's no, really no, it's... the the chaos of the battlefield for people that don't spend a lot of time actually fighting melees. It's pretty overwhelming just to keep track of, hey, there's 140 dudes in front of me and I've got to stick with my 30 dudes. And hey, Bruce, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> Hey, this is the reason I carry around binders. And uh -huh. um, we actually have a question in the chat about like, what's the upwards limit of effective co communication that your commanders can have in a scenario or happen before a scenario. And it really depends. It depends on the scenario. It depends on how big the melee is. Um, I'll let the panelists take it from there. But uh, in my experience on the field and running things behind the scenes, um, we find that the more complicated a scenario becomes or the more people you have participating in a scenario, uh, the upwards limit of communication can be anything from, holy crap, you showed up two minutes after lay on, like here's what you're supposed to be doing, to people who show up the night before for like a command meeting and then want to talk about it for six hours over a bottle of tequila. Like it, it just really depends and getting 200 people to do that so I'm going to open that up um, to those secondary goals. Like, what is too many secondary goals? How do we communicate them better? And how do we implement them into more melees without overwhelming people? Anything more than secondary is too many. Yeah, I was going to say oh, yeah. one, maybe two, if you're really, really lucky and you got a small little battle, like, uh, you know, like War of the Wings, it's about 60, 70 fighters. You maybe can get away with two maybe 
if yeah. you're lucky. So what are some good. examples of those secondary goals? That uh, So I, I taught a class on this, so I'm going to read off of it. You can have race okay. conditions. Oliver's going to read to us later, so. All right, you can have your race conditions. You can have, you know, just um, define survival, uh, rescue missions, searching and finding something, um, harassment, harassing uh, somebody can be a goal, capturing something, uh, attacking a specific thing and destroying it uh, with a specific condition. I'll give you an example of that. I built an RBG cannon. And what they had to do is get the cannon from one side of the field to in front of the castle and shoot the gate. And once they were able to do that, the gate opened up. So things like that. Um, chasing, you're chasing something. So somebody's got a head start, you've got to catch up with them. And there's a condition uh, attached to actually what uh, catching them means. So there's a ton of stuff you can do. But realist, and, and if you if you mix it up, nobody's going to be able to do it. You can only pick one. So, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was thinking about the the question about uh, about the limits of communication. Also, um, if you're talking about like how many people can as a, as general can you influence on the field directly yourself. Um, the limit that I tend to work with and the mid realm generally is tended to work with is you can, you can have about five to seven people probably that can focus on the fight and you, and then each of them can have about five people that can pay attention to the, to them carrying down. And that's, that's kind of how we ended up with our, with our fundamental breakdown into, into pretty much five person teams. And it works out nicely with our number of regions so that we can keep everything on a reasonable scale and you don't have to have the entire battlefield. Just like, with 350 people on the field, I guarantee that the, the folks far out on the flanks are never gonna hear the general, but their commander might hear their next door neighbor regional echoing a command that they can then relay down to their people. So directly influencing, maybe five. I would say five on, once you're on the field is probably about your limit for the most part. And there usually aren't people close enough to you that more than five or 10 people can hear you. I you usually give my them. sub commanders conditions upon which there are a variety of choices they can make. If this happens, mm -hmm. do this. If this happens, do that. And if anything else happens, just, you know, here's our overarching goal. Yep. And there's a whole, whole bunch of classes on that, which is a separate, again, five hours and lots of booze. <laughs> hey, hey, I wasn't referring to you about that bottle of tequila. No, <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> All right, so we just had someone pop up in the chat and kind of ask a little bit more about the alternate win conditions and some of the pros and cons of those. So instead of opening it up to like a really big list, um, why don't we have each person, each panelist, tell us about their favorite alternate win condition and like pros and cons, just two minutes each, real quick, short, simple, to the point. Who wants to go first? Favorite. Because I can sit here and I can think of non-favorites <laughs> to go the other direction. You know what? Go the other direction then. What is your least favorite alternate win condition and why? Anything that can turn into a sprint. And that's, <laughs> that's, why, I went with, that's why I went with a slightly secondary win condition. Because something where you, I don't mind something where you have to get a thing. But in general, the solution when you have to get a thing is that you can't let them take it back to their line because that's easy, that's a sprint. Mm -hmm. You have to make them take it through the other line in some way. That's, that's how you fix that, that scenario. Um, occupying buildings, when it, again, avoid the D&D &D map, like <laughs> just avoid that. But if you have a limited number of buildings um, with some fun terrain, that, um that tends to be fun like something where you have and honestly here's actually the way to describe it i realize this is very vague something where there are multiple ways that you could win it multiple i mean again the field battle there's three things you can do you go like this you go like this you go like this which is nice and easy it's good i i like scenarios where it's like okay well we can focus all on this building or or we can focus on this building and halfway through we could do this, but there's a lot of stuff that can happen and change. That it's, 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 the flow chart has a lot of options. I like those. Yeah, I'm with you on that. That's, 
the the battle format that I developed for forty Penzig forty two that's I think kind of continued on since then at this point. Um, it was a, there's an open field, a broken field, and also a building a, a building or set of buildings uh, that allows a allows your, your participants to go do do fun things according to what they think is fun. If you've got people that want to run around in circles and have an open field battle, they can do that. If they want to play around obstacles, they can do that. If they want to go to the D and D town battle, they can do that. Um, but at the same time, the, you as as your as your as the fight's going on, the conditions change. You can see how the other side is focusing and make choices based on that. And I love giving the fighters a chance, the fighters and the commanders a chance to make choices. Uh, it makes for so much more interesting a fight. And I actually, I have to say, I kind of love the D&D town battle in one particular way. Um, it really, really rewarded um, people n understanding the win condition. When nobody understood that the game was to go in and get all the gold, that was a really easy win, even though the mid was outnumbered because they gamed the rules and nobody on their side said, wait a minute. And yeah. Is it kind of cheesy? Absolutely. But a fair fight is one you shouldn't be in. I am the Baroness of Binders, and I think it is overkill to have to bring a clipboard out on the field as a commander to know yeah. which building yeah, is I, which. The, the part where it's like, take the barrel to the brewery and the chest <laughs> to the church. No, that part was ridiculous. But when they did the fight, it was just literally go in and grab all the gold and get it off the field, and if whoever, which, whoever ends with the most gold wins. That was kind of awesome. And uh, it didn't have to be a sprint fight because there was so much overlapping field. So to answer Simon from Meridier's question, um, the D&D &D town battle, it, you can see the <laughs> yeah, map. Yeah, so I'll talk so that it, anybody who's got you on speaker <laughs> view sees this. This is the map um, <laughs> of the 50 buildings. Let me just mention, I have a tendency to recreate this in Minecraft and just just for giggles and like i'm just already crying for whoever had to set that up <laughs> so because I'm, I'm 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 two minutes into it i'm like oh my god what the hell it had three different objectives involving three very different things well there are three different not not three simultaneous objectives no right no it was three different battles but uh so i was the former mid-realm chief of staff which means i keep the folders with all the previous penzik scenarios and the penzik like write-ups that we do uh to discuss tactics following big wars and what worked what didn't and whatnot um yes it looks like fun until you realize that there is a key in the folder with a hundred line items labeling each building <laughs> so back to the point of uh, about field battles being easy or fun for like as as somebody who'd been fighting about three years at that point this was fun this was just <laughs> this was nuts yeah, yeah, insanity fun, right? yeah. all right so we've heard from hawk and we've heard from peter on their favorite um or least favorite alternative win condition oliver work um i'll go or oliver whatever you want you, you ahead. I'll, I'll follow you. Okay. Uh, so I'm a big fan of metagame. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, so I like a scenario where it, I think it's really good. So you, you do your standard stuff, and then you throw a scenario out there where the commanders aren't actually sure what the objective is yet. They know their objective is maybe they need to intercept a messenger, or they need to, they need to find something. But once they find that thing, they actually know what the actual objective is. So the first person who finds that thing and gets that objective will now act upon that objective. And the commander who was unable to procure that information is now reacting to what happens on the field. And just all sorts of amazing things can happen at that point. And so I really like the meta feel of that. And I want to give you a, another example of what a meta game is for me. Um, I ran a, a whole series of events called Tournament of Armies. And Tournament of Armies was based on the idea of a snowball tournament. Uh, I don't know if you guys do snowball tournaments. Um, you do, right? So I fight, I fight, I fight Peter. Peter wins. He's now the commander of me, right? And 
and two other, and then now we're going to go fight two others, and whoever win, Peter and I win, and now Peter's the commander of, four, of three, right? That's a snowball tournament. Well, we did that with small units. And we also added in a system where everybody can get involved. So you had to build an army that consisted of heavy fighters, rapier fighters, arts and science, service, bardic, and they would all be able to earn uh, points and boons that would go towards the larger war effort. And so in that scenario, you have a multitude of armies. You have, in our situation, one of them, we did this for almost a decade, we, we would have like eight armies. And so we would do something called counting coup. And in counting coup, uh, originally counting coup meant you would be able to uh, ride up and steal something from your opponent and ride away. And you'd counted coup upon your opponent. Uh, in a simplistic form, it may be taking a scalp. So what I did was we had this, this, this huge uh, horse park and I took all eight armies and I spread them out all over the park. They couldn't see each other and everybody had an armband on. And you would count coup by collecting armbands and every armband was worth something. And so the, 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 the armies were out in this field on their own and they didn't know where anyone else was. And so now what they had to do was navigate the fields, the, the forests, these horse, horse paths. They would encounter other armies. Sometimes negotiations would happen. Sometimes combat would happen. Um, and if you didn't pick up the armbands, there were, no, there were no rewards involved in this. And so the metagame in that was uh, on the spot. They're having to uh, decide what it is that they're going to do uh, depending on the situation. And you may be about to engage one army when another one, and when I say an army, I'm saying there's 10 guys in front of you and there's 10, you know, 10 people behind you type of thing. Uh, uh, figure out what you're going to do with the, in, in these different situations. And by gathering those points, you can then use them to buy things like regenerations or negative regenerations or any of that kind of stuff. So that, that, that metagame, I think, really adds a lot to the situation for people uh, and makes the, the strategy and the tactics a lot more interesting. So that's, that's my favorite kind of scenario, is one in which commanders actually have to think about what it is they're going to do on every single move, because it's not as simple as lining up and killing the other guy. That whole scenario sounds awesome. Like, hey, on, on a, Do, we have a bad idea battle. Well, uh, so I was thinking on the grander scale, the thing that we've got Avery uh, running for the entire rapier community of the known world uh, that he wants to run sounds a bit like that. But damn, how how large was this horse park? Just uh, so I think. What size should I go looking for? So. Uh, the, the rapier, so you would have the heavies out there doing it, counting coup. You'd have the rapier fighters out there doing it, counting coup. Each army would be uh, the commander, the warlord, we called them, because they were, they were, this is a baronial level thing, and they were, they were competing to become the warlord of the barony. But each army would probably be 30 people, right? And so you would have on the heavy field, you'd have well over 100, 100 people all divvied up into their different armies. Also, you had to buy your army. So, for example, uh, you would be given 10 points to put together your base unit. A knight was worth two points, a combat archer is two points, everybody else is one point type of thing. So you'd put together your core unit and you'd do the same thing with your rapier fighters, your our, our target archers. The target archers would earn um, negative regenerations and the arts and science people would earn regens. And so they, in their arts and science competitions, they would earn 50 regens. You'd come back to the point and there'd be 50 regens there waiting for you. But then you would go into your scenario and somebody had earned a bunch of negative regens from their target archers and they would use it to wipe out all your regens uh, before the scenario started. So anyway, I can, we can talk about that another time. But that's the metagame that I'm talking about, like putting these rules. And actually, here's the most interesting thing. The first year we did it, people were like, whoa, this is very complicated. But they enjoyed it. The second year, like, we got this. We understand, right? And by the time we got to the eighth year, they understood the rules so well we actually kind of had to stop doing it because they were gaming all the rules because there was so much complexity. And we actually started again with a much more simple, different rule set. But for about eight years, it ran fantastic. That sounds epic. And um, we're definitely going to have to dive a little deeper with our next question. But first, we're going to let Oliver give us his favorite alternative win condition and why. So rather than repeat what a lot of other people have said, I'm going to go slightly different. Uh, Petrero War, which is a baronial war, it's maybe 100, 100 rapier fighters total. So it's smaller, more fun. Uh, we do things there that are that are different. Uh, one year I did a entire 
uh, everything was planned around Shakespeare. So one of the turn one of the scenarios was Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet were able to res their families on either side, which was the red team and blue team, were not. So the so Romeo's family could win if they kept you know, either family could win if they kept Ro Romeo and Juliet from meeting in the middle at the well where the priest would marry them. And or and by killing out the other side. Um, Romeo and Juliet would win by themselves and both armies would lose if they met at the well in the middle where the priest was, the, the marshal, and got married. So the, the idea was is you could kill Romeo or Juliet, and they'd come back and res and run around again, and then you could work on killing. So it introduced a third force into the field with an alternate goal set. Um, I talk about gaming. This did not go out as quite as I wanted it to, but it was magnificent. Uh, Doña Mora, who is now Maestro Mora, convinced her family that they should fight for her for love. And they wouldn't kill her. They just wouldn't attack the other one and eventually wiped out the other side. But her Romeo met her and they won. The second time we ran it, the gentleman fighter who was playing Romeo was doing rhyming couplets as he was attacking and killing the other people. It was amazing. And my jaw just dropped listening to him talk in verse while he's killing people. But it, it brought in a third uh, victory condition or a secondary victory condition for a third force on the field that people had to take into account. Um, that sounds amazing. I mean, when you give people an opportunity to shine like that, right? Uh, and then no shit there I was stories come out. So that's kind yeah. of <laughs> love it. And you got to admit, we are all frustrated actors. We want to sit there and we'll, we'll tell these stories. We'll, we'll, we'll boast. We'll, we'll come up and brag when we fight. We, these are the things that we do. And giving them the opportunity to do that is, is you're right. That's that, that story at the end at, around the campfire. It's like, we did this. And that was, this is what happened. That is a successful scenario. That sounds like a blast. I, I, I've had a couple of events where they've tried integrating things like that and it's been amazing. So I kind of want to delve into that a little bit with our next question, which is we have a game tester on panel. We've talked a little bit about the scenarios that are good, bad, and just plain ugly. Um, how do you play test and then subsequently break your scenarios for local events and wars or for events that have Romeo and Juliet getting married in the town square? Like, how do you plan and play test these? What is your process? Um, I'm going to actually start with our game maker and then we'll go from there. So I, I, I test it the same way I test anything. I, it's a, you, you test it, it's a paper test. And whether you, you whether it means you're cutting, you're using Lego or you're cutting out chits and assigning values to them um, and you don't do it alone, you bring some people in um, and you work through all the possible scenarios with them and you find out what your, what, your, what, your, what your fail states are. It's the win conditions are easy, it's the fail states that are hard to figure out. And so you gotta find every single one of them because if you don't, somebody else will the day of. Um, and it, it's, it's the most important thing you can do with the scenario, especially if you're, if you're building something that's gimmicky, that you've never done before, that nobody has experience with. The reason we do line battles is because that's battle tested. We know it works. So if you do something that nobody's ever done before, you're taking a huge chance with people's day. And so you really, really have to spend a lot of time doing that. So um, we'll talk about it. I'll spend a lot of time visualizing. Um, I'm very good at breaking scenarios and breaking uh, game rules. Uh, I, um, what I do for a living is, is building systems, economic systems, game systems, combat systems, whatever that is. So you, you, you build that structure, you put it down, you write it out, you think about it, you visualize it, you think about how you're going to break it, and then you go to the, the people that you know that, that are really good at breaking such things. And you, 
you work through it with them. And if possible, you even do it at practice. It's like, hey, you know, let's do a microcosm of this scenario at practice and see what happens. See how you can break this thing. And if you do that, you'll be successful. Even if, even if you miss something, it'll be something small, it'll be something minor, or you can even anticipate it. You can even say, I accept that risk. Right. Or as Hawk said, it's like, you know, they might try to cheat this way. And it's like, okay, well, how can we make that work? How can we roll that into the actual scenario? You, that's a judo move where you take that negative energy and you turn it into something that can actually be positive if you take, an, if you take it into account. So before I jump to the next panelist, um, when you're looking at breaks, what are acceptable breaks? Like what is okay? So we heard Hawk earlier mentioned that if they want to hide the chest, that's fine. But if they want to take the chest out of bounds, no go. Fine. What to you Set is an fire, acceptable break and fine. what is must be fixed? Yeah, it's always fun. The, 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 the razor, so when you look at a design, when you look at a system, you, you have a razor and the razor is always fun. So if there's a scenario that you're imagining and if you take that razor and you, you, you attack that idea, that possibility with the razor, if what's left is fun, then it's fine, right? If your rule, if your idea, if the, the way you're tackling this doesn't, if it makes it less fun, then don't do it. You always want to make it more fun for people. Usually for me, my definition of a bad break, um, I have two. One is that the other team can't quote unquote fix it. So using, I realize it's a silly example. If you set the chest on fire, there is no possible way for the other team to win. You have you have broken the game completely. It's not fun anymore. If you, and and that's my second point is I go, well, imagine I was, you know, I had just you have in 10 hours to golf wars, you know, paid all my MF golf wars, I'm fighting this battle, and the other team does it. What is my initial reaction going to be? I'm gonna admit, if they set the chest on fire, I'm gonna be pissed. So that's a bad break. If they hide it, my limit on that is kind of similar to Warwick's, is, is it hidden somewhere that I have a reasonable expectation I could go get it? Uh, Garrick mentioned a situation uh, years ago at Golf Wars, similar to this, there was a woman who fights in a wheelchair and we're like, she is a great person to hide this chest behind. It's instant defense. But it is something that can be battled against. Someone could find that chest, not an impossible task for the other team to come back and get that chest, find that chest, take that chest away. So that's my line between a break and a not break. I'm yeah, and that's, great. Not and that's great because ultimately it's, 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 as I said, what you're looking at is, will this ruin somebody's day, right? Okay. Yeah. Is uh, it still a game or not? All right, well, let's, let's jump to another panelist about how you play test. So I'm gonna jump to Peter next because um, Penzik is its own very special melee animal. Um, and so when I ask, how do you break or play test scenarios for something on the scale of Penzik? And what are some of the considerations for scaling up from a 10 on 10 melee or 20 on 20 melee or a 50 on 50 melee to a 300 on 300 melee? <laughs> yeah, um, scaling. Sorry, is easy question, I know. Yeah, no problem. My um, own ritual sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, before we, before we, when you, you asked me if I wanted to join in on this call, I was, I thought about looking back at some of the negotiation documents and the pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages, and pages of conversations with both my crown and my people and also the commander, the, the warlords from East Atlantia and Ethelmark, who were the, the primary the primary kingdoms at Penzik, um, and also the, the kingdom rapier marshals from those four kingdoms. Uh, there's a lot of debate and discussion in there, like, hey, does this feel safe? Does this feel like a good idea? But before we even get to that point, yeah, we're still, we're, we're wargaming before we get there. So there's a lot of sitting down with the crown and like, okay, your highness, what do you want your war to include? Um, is your, do you want your war to be super traditional, stand up and fight, and we're going to go out there and trade punches with the other side until there's only one army standing? Um, do you want something novel and surprising? What are you after? Or the crown coming to you and saying, hey, look, I don't care what you do, but this is going to be a rule, and there's, you don't have any choice about it. I've already talked to His Highness East, and that's just how it's going to be. 
so live with it. Um, and that happens. Um, and also that happens and you can't just go out there on the battlefield and be like, hey, y'all, I know this sucks, but the crown said this is how we're doing it. So that's what we got. Um, because that's not your job. It's not your job to make your crown look bad. Um, sometimes that involves a, an unpleasant sandwich later. But, um, but yeah, there's a lot of sitting down with, okay, what do I know my kingdom can do well? My army can do small unit tactics. My, my, my army is good at all staying together in a big chunk or breaking up by region and each region moves separately. Okay, what kind of scenarios are fun for people doing that? Um, that was one of the directions we went. Also, um, years gone now, we did a survey after Penzik too, to see what people wanted to do and got a lot of feedback from something like four or 500 rapier fighters across the known world uh, about what they thought was fun in a war and in a scenario um, and what kind of rules they enjoyed, what kind of rules they didn't like um, so that we could- Is that data available ideas. somewhere? Hmm? Is that data available somewhere? Uh, yeah, I should still have it. Yeah, it was a survey monkey thing. It's It's been a few years ago, but it's probably- I, I'd, like, I'd like it too. Yeah. yeah, me too. I, <laughs> I'll try to track that down and get it posted. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was really interesting to see what people had to say. That's actually where the the mixed field battle came from because there was a lot of a lot of that asked for. They're like, I just want to go out and do what I want to do and have opportunities for other people to do what they want to do, and then figuring out how can we make it possible for three hundred and fifty to four hundred people to understand the fight have fun fighting and be safe fighting all at the same time without it being easily breakable. Um, every once in a while we fail at that, sprinting the war point or that bizarre banner push we did a couple of years ago that turned into a quagmire. Um, but we did try to, we tried to war game that. That one, the, the, the banner push, we tried really hard to war game it and, it and it still worked up to about 100 fighters. But when you changed it to 300 fighters, it broke down and there was just there was no way to see that real clearly ahead of time. What um, what broke down at the end? Or... Uh, the fact that it was just impossible to get to the banners. Mm -hmm. Once one banner made it across and scored, everything just locked down in a box. And, and, and both sides so realized- that also a, a field proportionality thing? What's that? How, a field proportionality issue? Yeah. Okay. How could you have uh, anticipated that? Honestly, it was it was something that we should, that we kind of considered and nobody thought, well, no, nobody's just going to decide that, to stop fighting and sit on their, on, sit on home base. Cause that's no fun. And we, we overestimated the commitment to winning rather than going out and having fun. So <laughs> we, we could, we could have foreseen it. You're right. Yeah. I, I misspoke. No, there. I, I, that wasn't critical. I was just like, no, no, you're right. Well, though. You know, it, so it sounds like you actually did consider it. You just didn't weight it heavily. Enough. Right. Yeah. We didn't weight it heavily enough. Yeah. Yeah, and it turned out that, that that was exactly what they did, and it was a winning strategy. It was totally reasonable and legit. It just wasn't much fun. So uh, people will always go summer. for the win, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not always, though. It always, depends yeah. how it depends how crazy the scenario is, mm -hmm. or if they remember what the goal is. A banner is easy. MacGuffins or bags of gold might not necessarily be right. and figuring out what people are going to do is I think part. It also depends on the nature of the event like at right. war even if even if all the rapier fighters rapier commanders rapier marshals are sitting there saying let's have fun yeah let's have fun mm -hmm. there's entire kingdom's egos yeah. on the line mm -hmm. and Crown, some of the crowns yeah. <laughs> out on the field that day were super angry about the way it went down. And some of them were like, wow, that was perfect. That was awful, but it was exactly the right solution. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's also some cultural difference between different different wars, different kingdoms. Oh yeah. Like how seriously one kingdom takes it versus another kingdom. How seriously like Penzik is versus Gulf Wars versus War of the Wings. I mean, my household shows up at War of the Wings because it's the only thing we can all fight together. We don't give a crap about winning. We're just like, wee, fight! <laughs> so at this point that they let us be a third party. <laughs> it's true, they, they wouldn't let us win that year. They mean. <laughs> uh, so I've heard this said as a poor colonial coming in from Ontier to Gulf Wars. I've heard people say Gulf Wars is like the warm up for Penzik. And that's why Gulf Wars <laughs> is more fun 
because people are like, we're here to have a good time. We're warming up. We're working stuff out. And then once Penzik happens, everyone's like super serious and focused. And if it gets a little less fun. I think, of I, course, I, it just is less serious. It is. I, I, as a mid-realmer who, who has been on command staff now for a lot of years, many years, <laughs> I, I can tell you, we roll up to golf course and go, not our war, not our problem. Hey, Hawk, where do you want us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I definitely can, can agree with that. Um, so we haven't heard from Oliver yeah. on this question. Uh, how do you break or play test your scenarios for local events? So <laughs> we do a combination of everything that people have talked about. We, the advantage of Petrero being a baronial war is it is a training ground to get people to learn how to run and become the person running the event. Um, and we have, we have mentored uh, people going forward with that. And for Petrero, it is all about fun. It's just a matter of people coming out, having a fun time. You come up with interesting stuff. Everybody has a great time there. When you get to Australia or to Great Western War, it's a bit more serious because you have different kingdoms involved. But nothing, nothing approaching the level of a Penzik. When my first trip to Penzik was like, oh, my God, you guys are <laughs> serious. <laughs> Self-editing here. Um, uh, if you have a complaint, you can submit that in triplicate, please. Hey, it's got to be stamped and notarized. Thank you very much before right, it goes you. in my files. But and Bruce, ha Bruce has the forms for you. I do. But what we do is we'll sit around, somebody come up with ideas, we'll, we'll, we'll hash them out as a group. Uh, we'll play test it at the local baronial uh, practice with what we can, because you know, you've know you got 15, 20 people there, you can't do much. Uh, Kaid has a history of having war practices. We used to have a more adversarial role against Aitenveldt with Australia War. It was, it was very, they had war points and it was very serious there, not the level of Penzik, but it was serious. And so we would have quarterly war practices. We would go out and, and do the melee and this would be the time for us as a kingdom to split the kingdom in half and play test some of the scenarios that went out. And you could do those three, four times a year. You then have the ability to get a micro scale version of your scenarios tested out enough to get it to the point where you can go forward with them. Um, so you have, you, you, you teach classes on scenario design. You've put a lot of thought into this. Do you have, uh, I, my developer brain's saying, thinking of it as a sandbox, an internal play test uh, that you put scenarios through? And how, what does that look like? <sighs> okay. Without going into class, which <laughs> I think I'm going to have to now volunteer to teach at, at the VAR in a week or two, um, I break everything down into pieces. Terrain, the size of the thing, what the goals are, uh, what, because if you think about it, we really do have all of our scenarios come down to either a line battle, a town battle, a forest battle, or they have a goal where you capture the flag. All these things are the, the major pieces and it's how you put them together and what, what you call them and what other little things you tweak them with going forward. So yeah, for me, I've got all these things out and then I take the resources and the limitations and combine them to come up with something. I try to have a theme they're going to, to work around to give some interest to them and make things a little bit different. Uh, one yeah, of the yeah, other- the question, do you try to tell a story? Yes. But at the same time, I try not to make it overly complicated. Um, I will actually draw up a paragraph on what each scenario is and then I have six or seven things on what's in it, whether or not it's a there are RBGs or spears, whether or not it's a res battle or a limited res battle or not, what the victory conditions are. And all these things are listed out for each individual scenario. So it is actually down on paper and can be discussed. Um, I had another thought and I forgot what it was now. Um, but yeah, in my, in my brain, I try to work things out ahead of time and I'll try to break my own scenarios. I think the question was, do you have a mind castle? 
mind castle. That, that's term. right. The Sherlock reference. He was asking if you, you have a sandbox in your mind where, where you where you play test these things. So yeah, yeah like you said, okay, I'm going to run X. Yeah. Then you start a process where you think, okay, so if I'm if I'm you know trying to win it this way, that let's say you provided two win conditions. I'm trying to go for this win condition. What are the exploits? Do you start working through a, a process for analyzing the scenario you've built? Yes, maybe not to that level of, of breaking it down that much, but I do try to go through the, that process. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to break my own scenarios in my head. That works. Um, so I'm going to hop from you to Hawk because we've heard about Penzik, we've heard about a local events, we've heard from our professional game designer. Um, Hawk, what are some of the considerations for play testing and breaking scenarios for Golf Wars? So, we've had a lot of uh, comments in the chat about it being more laid back. So, yeah, <laughs> it's fine. So mine is kind of similar to Warwick's. Um, um, there is, for what it's worth, a Facebook group of generals who, anyone who's added to this group saying I need to try. Hawk, can you hold on a sec? I don't know if it's just me, but we're losing you. So I, one, I think she's buffering. Yeah, yeah, give it a sec, girl. Oh. No. Yeah. Is she frozen for everyone else? Yeah. yeah it's, it's cyclic for her that sometimes she that happens. Yeah, it happens on Monday nights, but it rec she recovers. Let's give her a minute. Because right. I'd like to hear from her. I would too. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? A little Almost. bit. You're coming Better. back. She is. We have a 404 error in our. Uh... <laughs> oh. Um, Let's all go to the lobby. Hawk 404. <laughs> there she is. There. Yay! Yay! All right, we're listening. There we go. So, um, don't know where I got cut off, so I'll start from the beginning. Mine's kind of similar to Warwick's. Um, anyone who's ever been a general at Golf Wars gets added to this Facebook group. I don't tend to kick people off of it afterwards, even when they, quote, unquote, retired. And I have certain people that I know are just good at breaking scenarios, like, it's just how their brains work. Um, Connor the Gypsy is an example. Changed it. Uh, damn Connor. Connor is a great example of that. A um, couple of Advantians. I spend a lot of my summers up at Advantia, so I know a lot of them up there. Um, pretty much anyone I can find. And I will completely admit that when I get my hands on them, I find a five-year-old and ask them, how would you break this? Because they tend to be really good at it. Um, and so once we get this scenario, I kind of go through it in my own head and go, well, how would I break it? I try to fix all of those. And then I hand it to my people. I go, here, what questions would you have? How would you break it? What would you do? What would you do if you were intentionally like put on your, put on your hat of being a really mean, stupid person who just cares about the win and not honor? What would you do? And it, usually we don't have too many surprises. I mean, I get some occasionally. I'm like, well, we, we didn't expect that. But for the most part, that group manages to hit anything that that would most people think of. I know I've been I've been the asshole for the mid realm a couple of times. Excuse my language, um, because I came from the east originally. Um, so they ask me to break like you would if you were eastern. Uh, I'm okay. sorry, Oliver. I jumped on top of you. What was your question? So I was just going to add. We usually have five or six people when we are at the event and the last minute and we say what's going on and give the scenario, we'll have people who are not bashful to pop, to pop up and go, well, what about this? And we either can give an answer right away or make a, a very quick decision on yes, no, that can or cannot be done. Um, those people are a gift. I yeah. love those people. So that, that's, that's the, trial by fire for the people running it is to be able to make a decision on their feet at within a second's notice to determine what they how they want their scenarios to run so i will admit that those are the people that i recruit for my pre-testing like those are the people i'm like you i need you so i can at least have you know more than 10 seconds to make this decision 
you always run into some version of that, but that's who I grab. Well, this is a perfect segue for the last like formal question I'm going to ask tonight before we get into no shit there I was stories and the Q&A from the chat. Um, the last question, uh, we've heard a range of things from uh, trying to tell a story with Melee to sometimes the rules really suck to just making people happy or not letting people be jerks on the field. How can we make Melee scenarios better? And I'm going to just open that up to all four of our panelists. <laughs> Have at. <laughs> I mean, this sounds terrible. My initial my initial answer is not very politically polite, um, and I hate to say get the crowns out of the decision process. Like that's not a polite way to say this, but I've I've had years at golf wars where that would have changed everything. It's like telling the crowns, look, you're great, I love you. You've picked up a rapier once in your life for 20 seconds, please stop telling us what to do. Like, and I think we've all ended up with some version of that, of the crown going, I've got a great idea, I'm gonna, we're gonna do RBGs. And we all go, please, no, 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 please, your majesty, please, could I talk you out of this, your majesty? No, 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 RBGs are great. And we go, okay. And, and like Peter said, and then as the Armic, it's your job to kind of go out there and be like, Bobby, oh, geez, you're all going to love this. I swear. I really don't want to. on a bridge. <laughs> oh, on a bridge. <laughs> you're going to love this, I swear. And try your best to support it and make the best of it. But that, um, that extra layer of somebody else making the decisions who, no matter how much they're trying to help, because they are, I know it comes from a place of love, theoretically. It, it can just, part of my language, it can just fuck it completely up. Just totally and completely, and it's like, yeah. Yep. So, yep. and it, it, I don't know if we'll ever get a realistic version of that to actually happen. Um, my favorite crowns to work with are the ones who are like, hey, you know, I, I kind of want to see this, I kind of want to see that, but let me know what, what can I do, how can I make this the best for Rapier? You tell me, I'm here to consult with you. And so I don't know if we have anyone on this list who is serving his crown, who has ever served his crown, but yeah, letting, letting the, I hate to say this, letting the experts be the experts. Like There's uh, somebody in the chat who served his crown and he uh, said amen to what you said. <laughs> so I think that- well, there we go. <laughs> They're not gonna take away your birthday. Hi today. Bart. <laughs> POQs, no take backs. Avery says so. <laughs> do, do you do? Do you believe everything Avery says? <laughs> oh, I do. It's, uh, not, it's, it's, it's on a mug. It's got to be true. I can buy it on a mug. <laughs> no, I'd like to, I'd like to weigh in. I'm go ahead, Oliver. No, I'm. I always speak before you. You go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh my oh, God, God, I love that. It's 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 so polite. <laughs> Mine is very, mine is very simple. So is somebody supposed um, to say sorry. When I started playing uh, in uh, rapier uh, melee is what brought me into the SCA, and I very very quickly and I was already I was already making games at the time, and I very very quickly uh, d uh, figured out ways to take advantage of the rules that were there, um, and then I started doing service and I became a champion and I became an MIC and I realized that all that shit that I'd done had broken everything. And so I realized I had to fix it. And one of the things that I did to fix it was RBGs. RBGs are way OP. And so most people just say, we're not going to play with RBGs. And that's too bad because they can actually be really fun if you do them right. So one of the things I did was I came up with a convention. And the convention was this. I brought both commanders in, it, to me and I said, bring me all of your shot. And pour it on the ground and count it. And both sides did. And by that point, we were in massive RBG detente happening. It was just ridiculous, right? We were in gun wars. And this was literally my and my household's fault because this is, this is, the, this is the, the scenario that we, because we'd figured out you could win with these things. You could really easily win with these things. Um, but now that I was running the war and there was, you know, we, we, we had 120 people in the field and they were all very invested in this. It was like, we have to fix this because this is silly. Nobody's happy at the end of it. And so I had them counted up and one side had 45 shot and the other side had 300 shot, which is case in point of why it was a bad, why things weren't working. And I said, okay guys, um, 
Both sides have 45 shot. For the entire war, no gleaning. Use them whenever you want. We have eight scenarios. It fixed it. Totally fixed it. Um, so I'd say, how do you make scenarios more fun? Is you look for the things that make scenarios not fun <laughs> and you fix them. So it, it's almost an East Coast, West Coast thing or inner kingdom anthropology. Um, the crown of Kaid and at our wars, both Petraro, Great Western, and even Astrea, the crown come out and if they want to, and they'll play with us, but they don't actually try to mold it in their format. They don't tell us, oh, well, I want you guys to do this. They're like, how can I play? Because they just, they're just excited to come out and, you know, grab a, a rapier blade and, and poke at people you know, sort of half incognito and half not, even though they've got their retinue around them. It's like they're obviously the crown. We treat them as a target on the field, but they don't, I mean, it's coming out and telling us, well, you guys need to change this scenario. It's not something I've ever seen out here. It, it may be something that shows up and I'll admit, it tends to show up the larger the war and the more crowns that are in any way of all, it would, like, I don't think I've ever had a crown. I've had one, let me go, let me phrase that. I've had one single crown who's ever in any way tried to influence what Melee looked like at a local event, kingdom event. Um, and it was literally, they said, I don't want giant shields. That was the extent of their, their thing. Um, but once you get up to stuff like Golf Wars and Penzik, where it, there is some politics involved in it, that's where you start seeing that sort of thing, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much ego involved at that point. And they forget it's not about them. It's about all these people who have taken the time to come have fun in their vacation. And that's where I sometimes, uh, it's another political discussion about the crowns and their responsibilities. But that's, that's another night. A little bit more <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> Oh no, that'll be fighting the world <laughs> after dark. We will not be recording that session. <laughs> um, so Oliver, I, I want to follow up on something you said earlier, where you talked a bit about how you want to try to tell a story with scenarios. Um, is there any way we could incorporate that throughout the known world a little more to make Melee better? What would you suggest for someone trying to write that scenario right now? And could we put it in a war? <laughs> yeah. It, uh, um, I think the answer is, did you want to say something, Hawk? So the, the only kick that I'll put on that, it's kind of a general thing, is we have one, when, um, when you mentioned the Romeo and Juliet one, Gulf Wars has that, um, the Montagues and Capulets little, it's not a war point, it's a, um, a melee. And I've got people who love that, and I used to fight it, and I absolutely loved that battle. And I've got people who despise it, who are like, ugh, this story and this, I just want to kill people. I don't want, I don't think you're ever going to please everyone. I will put this out there, that if anyone has a melee scenario that they would like to run at Gulf Wars, not necessarily at a war point, but just for giggles, let us know. Like, I, I can't speak for Worcester, but I'm going to anyway. We will Oh, take uh -oh. it. Name one top five muscle. I'll help you play test it. Whatever the heck you need. People love those sort of things that are optional. Let us know. We will gladly help in any way to make that happen. Congratulations, you have a test dummy field. <laughs> and that's and that's, that's what it takes is is to have something that you can put in there. Because even though we can play test this at at the Baronio and Kingdom level, until we actually get out there and have something that is at an actual war level, it's you don't know everything. And you don't know how to people things. I will say that Kaid on the armored field, which is no longer my background, um, they are primarily simply they want open field, they want bridge battles, and they want castle battles. And for Petrero War, even though it's a fun war, they have open field, bridge battles, and castle battles. Every once in a while, somebody will come along and go, hey, I want to do this war that happened in 1493 over here in Germany. We're just going to kind of do this. And the armored guys are like, no, I just want the fight. So 
we, we have a range. Everybody's on a spectrum of whether or not you just want to go punk somebody or you want to go have fun or you're a tactician or you're a gamer. We're all on there somewhere and you're not going to get everybody to be happy. If you have, a, and this is why I like to have a, a spread of things to offer everybody any given day is that somebody will find, everybody will find something that they enjoy, even if they don't enjoy the whole thing. Warwick, your hand went up. Yeah, I, so often in the same situation, and one of the things that I do, I, I love the idea of a narrative in your day or in your two days of war. And one of the things you can do is, you know, you look at your audience, you're like, okay, these guys, they just want, they want a bridge battle, they want a field battle, they want a castle battle, they want a gate battle. You can, you can use that and you can still tell a story with that. Um, a push battle is a great way to do that. I'm sure everybody knows what a push battle is. You 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 push for you know you start at the you start at the bridge, and if you win, you move to the field, and if you lose, you go back to the bridge, and if you win, you go back to the field until you get to the castle and back and forth. But one of the things you can do is you can have branching scenarios that use all the standard battle formats that people are used to. But if you win here and you get maybe the secondary condition, there's a couple of choices that can happen. You can maybe go to the bridge or you can go to the field or whatever. By adding, I think, personally, by adding those narrative, narrative elements to your fights, you invest people more in what's happening. Um, and so it's not so much, oh, I have to think about my tactics and that's tiring and all oh, the strategy is very, very, uh, it's not what I want to do right now. But if you can engage them in a simple story like that, where there's a couple of decision tree, decision points that they can make, I think you can you can start to bring them into that type of thinking. Things can become a lot more interesting. I just find the engagement is much higher when you do things like that. All right, so last but not least, uh, Peter. Um, let, let's go. Uh, <laughs> how can we make melee scenarios better? Well, to hit the opposite unpopular opinion from Hawks. Um, also, we need to get better as a community at doing rape your melee and doing melee in, in general. We need to understand tactics better across the board. And it's one of the big frustrations that I've had is the, the people that are like, I don't like melee. I like single combat. I don't like single combat. I like melee. They both have so many overlapping ideas. And a lot of the way that I think about the army on the field when I when I when I you know got 200 people behind me going okay what are we doing boss um, is a lot of the same way that I think about the fight when I'm walking onto the field with say a sword in my right hand and a dagger in my left hand what can my sword do what can my dagger do what is my opponent's stance telling me about what they're doing what are their threats telling me versus what we can project and how are they likely to react all of that stuff comes from understanding the fight on the individual level to understanding it on the small unit level to understanding it on the like baronial scale or regional scale up to understanding it on an inter-kingdom inter army scale where you're like i've got 90 mid realmers and i've got 40 ethel mark and i've got a smattering of other smaller kingdoms that have come in um, sometimes i'm lucky enough to have oliver in there with us it's been a minute but <laughs> um but if we can all understand how the fight works better, we can all go out there <laughs> and and have better <laughs> fights. Um, people people are going to be less frustrated. We're going to have a lot less people blowing their top on the field and being angry about what's going on because they didn't understand or they got caught by surprise from somebody that hit them from 179 degrees over their sword shoulder and they had no idea they were there, but they were still an angle as you get more familiar and more comfortable on the battlefield you become more aware of those things yeah you can still get surprised like i said earlier if you're in a fair fight you shouldn't be there but you know somebody is somebody is going to be in the wrong fight every time and your job is to make sure that's not you and the better my opponent is at making sure that it's not them the more interesting the fight is for me the more interesting the fight is for my for my unit or my region or my army uh, and i that's why we've been in the middle of trying to really push talking between the kingdoms. Like we built friendships, built friendships that didn't really exist in that way before between the mid realm and the East command staff, for instance, it used to be super antagonistic and it was all about how can I wind them up the best and screw them over the worst in, in negotiations. And 
for the last quite a few years now, it's been a lot more about, hey, how can we make this a fun fight for your guys and for us so that both sides have a chance to win and can play to our strengths while we still build a really awesome battle? Um, and it's a little bit more meta than, than how do we build a specific scenario, I guess. But I think that's the foundation to making it more fun for everybody, personally. Wait, wait, wait. The exchange program is working? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're mostly a mid-realmer now, Bruce. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm still too Eastern to be mid-realm. I, <laughs> I, I mean, do you, okay. do you make the vroom vroom sa- the shroom, shroom sounds when you swing your sword? No. <laughs> So, no, I, I'm sorry. So for background for everyone, um, Peter was the general when I moved to the mid from the east. And at my very first war camp, which was absolutely like, I was not into melee. I was a eastern thug from South Jersey who liked to fight tournaments and do drills. Show up to my first war camp and the first thing he says to me when I started DFBing some people was, oh, you're too eastern to be mid-realm. <laughs> it was it was just the disparage in his voice. So every time I get a chance to crack that joke at him, I do. <laughs> I mean, for, for what it's worth, years and years ago, there used to be a thing in Antiora where their the equivalent of a Vivar tier was Vivar uh, death to Trimeris. And that was like part of their culture of, mm-hmm. I remember a guy that I knew who literally like I'd made friends with him at one golf wars and he came back two golf wars later with a Trisco tattooed on the bottom of his foot so wow. that he could stomp on Trimeris every day. And he was he knew I was Trimerian and he was showing this to me proud of it. Like he had no he he didn't even consider it like, holy crap, really? That and um I don't even know who the crown was, but there was a crown in Antiora who kinda kind of realized this and kinda went, you know what, we're not gonna do that anymore. That's not cool. That that that's going too far and so i think that that kind of changed a little bit it's, it's part of why we kind of try to make golf wars you know we claim it's another war some hospitality down here you know um and it's part of trying to stop it from being too ridiculously competitive which is what we like and everyone likes something different and that's okay like it's okay that you know we that, that with all the love of my heart towards Bruce, when she's talking about, oh yeah, I got this binding, you know, we counted how many minutes it takes East Realm to take three sips of water so that we could time up. I'm like, <laughs> hey, hey, I was following instructions from my crown. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm sure majesty. you were. <laughs> but I will admit, like my face kind of went, okay. Well, that's how, Batman like, and useless, that's okay. Man. I'm sure it is. I'm, I'm sure it is. We have some crazy data now, though, because of it. And then we went back and went, huh, maybe we should teach people that melee isn't an individual fight, but a team sport. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> so we are coming up towards the end of the second hour. Means it's time for two things. Uh, first, uh, our panelists uh, no shit there was stories about your absolute favorite scenario ever that you've ever fought in. Um, and uh, Q&A from the audience. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter going on in the, in the chat uh, script. Um, thank you. <laughs> if you have a question that we haven't answered, please go ahead and post it to the group chat and we'll uh, get to it after the no shit there was stories. So, make Oliver go first. Oliver. Okay, I'm going to do four things. Um, my, my first attempt at doing anything with doing scenarios was at an Australia war when I was very new, back in 2005. There was, the day was done, everybody was finished with scenarios, and they had a bear pit. They had four bear pits and a line of a hundred fencers all waiting to get in it. And it took like 20 minutes to get up here just to fight a couple fights and get back out again. And a lot of us were bored with that. So the armored had left their hay bale castle for the day. And it was, so we pulled like 40 people out of the line. And I started creating scenarios on the fly. And what 
came to me at some point is I had a whole, all these RBGs. This was back when RBGs were big and everybody had guns with lots of ammo. And they go, we want to play too. But I didn't have enough marshals to keep the entire field straight. So what I did is I put them in the center. We created a small fort, called it the Alamo. And with a bunch of fighters, I wanted to fight with them. And all the RBG people were there. And we had powder monkeys that could go out and glean shots off the field you could not kill that could come back and just keep them firing so the large force on the outside was attacking the alamo with unlimited shots from the inside it made for a happy set of of people that don't normally get a chance to fire all of the shots they want my favorite scenario i ever came up with is what i call the drunken captain this was when i was doing a whole seafaring because my barony has califia has a sea serpent so we did a whole seafaring thing the drunken captain. And what it was is I had five volunteers that would play drunks in the city. They each had a bag. Three of the bags had just a, a flower lay on and they were just drunks. And two of the bags had either a red sash or a blue sash and they were the captains. Now this will not work in a, in a war that you have to win because obviously it's an escort the noble and in a bigger war where there's a war point, you just take the captain and you rush him back to your side and you win. Not here. This was play acting to the max. Before we even started, they were out in the town staggering around. I had one guy pretending to throw up in his mask while, before we could hit lay on. And the captains, you could not kill them. They, you, if you killed them, they go down for a three count, came back up because they were drunk. They were armed with this dagger, everybody else had no reses and the captains would argue with the people trying to rescue them and the play acting was so immense we did this five times during the course of the weekend because people wanted to keep playing it over and over and we've had a version of this every war since uh both at patrero and great western do you have a write-up for it yes you should post that somewhere so we can steal it that goes on my third point is I, I, I have a Google Drive where all of my Ripier scenario class information and all the scenarios that I've done are posted there and I can share that at some point or maybe I'll save that for a reveal in a, uh, a future class teaching here. Um, also I have in there from Antir uh, a Ripier scenario doc by Casey Stalter. Does that name ring a bell? Yeah, had, Casey doesn't play anymore. Okay, we had gathered together a whole bunch of scenarios uh, to share. And I think it's something that we need to do is, is get a database of all these scenarios somewhere that we can share and people can look at them going, hey, that looks interesting. I should be able to play that and, or modify it. Nice, yeah. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. And I forgot my fourth thing, so I'll, I'll shut up for now. Next. Is, this right. the no sh is this the no shit there I was stories? Yeah, that's yeah, what it's yeah. supposed to be. Absolute <laughs> bestest uh, scenario you ever saw, fought in, whatever. So mine, mine's a little long, so I don't know. I can go now or I can wait. I Look, I ain't got nowhere else to be. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, I started out as a fringe player. And uh, I, we were lucky that the leader of our household was actually a uh, Olympic fencing coach. Um, and so we spent a lot of time in schoolyards practicing because in the Pacific Northwest, you can do that eight months out of the year. And we didn't, we didn't go to a lot of events for a while. We were mostly just about the sorting. And then he's like, you know, I got out of the SCA a while ago. Um, but really, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of us now. And there was like 10 or 12 of us that were meeting three times a week and sorting with these guys. And this is when we'd, uh, this is when we were transitioning from fiberglass to uh, FAs and, and things like that. Um, and so we started going to events and we, we realized very, very quickly that even though we, we were fringy, we were, actually, we were actually quite dangerous because of all the training this fellow had given us. And we'd, um, we became quite a commodity because we were mercs and people were paying uh, uh, us in like food, and booze and you know uh, sp sparklies and things like that for us to fight on their side and as our household grew and grew and grew the um the payments started to become 
uh, onerous because there was people were dumping real money into this. It was like this, it, start, it started to become too much. We thought the fun was starting to come out of it. So we came up with this plan and we realized that in this war, this is the Clinton War in uh, Northern BC in, in which a thousand people would show up. This is a humongous event for this part of the country. And it was the event to go to. Um, and so we would have we would have several hundred rapier fighters in the field, and there'd be hundreds and hundreds of heavy fighters in the field. We had a castle; it was an amazing event, beautiful in the evening with all the pavilions and stuff. And this is in the late '90s and the early 2000s. Um, and so we came up with this plan. We uh, we called together all the other mercenary households, and uh, that was like three main ones. So there was a ton of other mercs that were just random, but we called up the the commanders and we said, look. There's this thing that we want to do. We've realized that there's a, as much of us, there's as many mercs as there are like main, main players, cadets and white scarves and all their households and stuff. There's as much of us as them. Um, and traditionally what happens is whichever side can afford the mercs wins. And we think that kind of sucks. So we, we created this whole scenario, this whole, this whole narrative where we invited both sides into our household to bid for our services. But what we did was we called all the other mercs into our camp first. And they came, we said, so here's what we're gonna do. We want you guys to all arm up and you're gonna line both sides of the roads. So we had 60 fighters in full kit lining the road when uh, the two sides, the two royalist sides were approaching our camp to buy our services. And so they had to walk through this gauntlet of all of these fighters to get to our camp and we had a full pavilion set up with table, food, wine. Uh, we had uh, we had uh, serving boys and girls with uh, food and everything. It was it was lovely. It was gorgeous. They had no idea what was going on. They didn't have a freaking clue. They thought they were bidding for sixty people, but we had all three of our war commanders there. And every time they made a bid, we just said, "It's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough." And we were shouting it at this point. We were they had like RBGs strapped to our chests and things. And finally, the Baron, the Baron of our Barony, Lionsgate, he finally, because I think at one point, one of us said, we could take it all. And he, you could see the light bulb go off in his head and he turned to the other, his, 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 his opposition that he thought he was gonna fight against. And he said, they can take it all. They think they can take it all. They're gonna take it all. And they got it. And they realized what we were proposing was a mercenaries versus the royalist scenario. And so that's what we actually did was we lined up um, and they lined up in classic line battle format. And it was, and it was all freaking white scarves and cadets in their households. Like it was a pretty scary setup, right? Because <laughs> we're all fringe players, but we got a bunch of RBGs and we had war shields that we'd created all these, these large triangular war shields. Um, and so, and I was in command. And so I had all my shields in the front and I had one unit of mercs on my left and I had one unit of mercs on my right and I had a reserve behind. And here's what I'd said. I'd said, look, Josie, who's running our left flank is actually cadet to Don Prosper, whom you may know as Devin Boorman, who runs Academy Duello. And I said, and I don't actually trust her not to turn on us at this. This is 1998, just so you know. I don't trust her to not actually turn on us at this point because she's the only cadet we have on our side. The rest of us are just a bunch of assholes in, in Renaissance clothing. Um, so I, it, I put a whole bunch of our people in her crew and then the lay on happens. And we've got all our shields. We've got the second row that I'm in. We've got uh, Jack's forces on the right and they're all RBGs. We got Josie's force on the left. We're advancing towards the line, and Josie's forces are are la are are, are uh, lagging behind. They're lagging behind greatly. They're they're behind us at this point, and I figure it's going to happen. They're gonna they're gonna jump us, and it's just going to happen. Um, and I figure at this point, because I'd put two people, three people in in her forces to take her out if this is what was going to happen. And I told Gwydion, who is behind us, our reserve, that you know, pick a side, but if Josie turns on us, you've got to go and mow them down. So I'm like looking at Josie because Josie is not bringing her forces forward and my forces have engaged the, the center, which is all white scarves and cadets. And so I'm looking at Josie, I'm like, Josie, Josie, come on. And then I turn back and our front line is gone. They've just all been killed. On the, as soon as we made contact, they were just destroyed. They were wiped out. Um, so now we're fighting 
We don't know what's happening. I'm fighting at that point with a very long deltin uh, and uh, and uh, a baton. I managed to sweep some blades, kill a, kill my good friend Draven. I'm then wiped out. Our whole center is gone. We're off to the side to watch what's happened. Jack's forces have also been wiped out. But here's the beauty of this: is Josie didn't turn on us. They were just uh, uh, a little nervous about what was going on, and so they lagged behind. Gwydion's forces went and uh, supported them, and we uh, decimated the center to the point that Gwydion and Josie's forces were able to actually mop up the rest of the field. And so this was um, one of my favorite stories because these were all fringe players, mercenaries, northern fighters, people that didn't get to come to a lot of practices, and we defeated the royalist forces. We we beat up the white scarves, we beat up the cadets, we completely, uh, well, it was a bit of a pyrrhic victory. I think there was eight of us left at the end, but anyway, we won it. So it was, it was pretty amazing. So that's my no shit there I was. Excellent. Um, Hawk, you're muted. This story comes with the caveat that I have, um, told this story several times. I've told it to someone who is in this story who claims that they were not nearly as cool as we make them out to be. And I told him to shut up because yes, of course he was. Um, and it, it happens at War of the Wings. I feel like most of my great melee stories happen at War of the Wings. So, um, a Bologna that takes place in Boone Bay, North Carolina. Um, and my household shows up and a rumor has started of my household that we just show up with a gazillion mods from around the known world. And unfortunately, it's becoming more and more true every year. But that's not how we started, we swear. We were all cadets when we started. Um, we bring a fairly sizable force and invite all our friends. This was one of our early years. Um, and it was a boat battle. So we had a boat set up. We had two gangways that came out of this boat. The boat had gunnels. One of the rules was that you may not fire under the gunnels because RBGs was a, a big thing at the time in that time. So we started on the outside and it was, you know, kill everyone type battle. And we marched our way, oh, we started, we started on the inside. We marched our way down one of the gangways, killing everyone in our path with our team. We turned to the marshal and we're like, can we go up the other gangway and just like squash people? And they're like, yeah, sure, do it. So, do, 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 we did. Squish, squish, everyone dies. Worked great. We have conclusively proven you may go up and down these gangplanks. Like you don't have to stay on the ship. Next battle, whoever was commanding our side, which was not me, decided that they were going to do a volley fire. But they made one terrible mistake, which is that they put the people who were doing the volley fire in front of the people with swords and didn't have a plan for how they were going to get out of the way. This is an important thing to plan if you ever want to do a volley fire. So the volley fire fired, him, almost no one, and the people on the boat fired back and killed like 90% of our troops in two seconds. It was a massacre. At the end of those 90 seconds, here's what I am left with. I'm left with myself with one arm, my dagger arm. I was smart enough to switch my sword to that hand and two riflemen. And on the other gangway is then uh, Don Adon, now Master Adon from Atlantia, who has also been armed, has decided, nope, he's too cool. He can just do this with his dagger and is using what I can only describe as offhand newbie. It was this new little fighter, quaking in her boots. She's got a rifle. You can tell she's just like, oh God, what am I gonna do? I can't, I, oh my God. I did not witness this. I was busy on my side. And in my head, I'm going, okay, they're gonna come down the gunway and they're gonna, they're gonna kill us all. We're dead in 10 seconds. Wait, wait, they're just kneeling under the gunnel. That's weird. Are they not gonna, I guess they're not gonna come after us. Okay. And so I, Turn to my gun and I go, okay, I'm gonna, you guys both loaded, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot them. Yeah, yeah, great idea, but, but they're under the gun. I'm like, it's okay. And I, they've said, loaded them you too. I'm gonna make them stand up. Marched up, expecting to be killed. Marched up, you know, towards the, the boat itself. Couple of people stood up, bang, 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 shot two or three people, backed up. They did not chase me. Huh, that's, that's weird. Okay. Did it again, you guys loaded it again, we'll do it again, do do, bang, bang, bang. Everyone dropped down again. That's, that's really weird. At this point, my gunners go, okay, so who do you want us to shoot next? Because we've run out of people surrounding the doorway. We've killed them all and somehow nobody wants to take their spots. Very strange. And uh, 
on a walk, I said, you see that guy in the back who looks like he's thinking about giving orders? I shit you not, some guy in the back, Scooby-Doo, whoop! <laughs> Kill him. And somehow no one wanted to give orders after that. It was just so weird. I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the other gangway, uh, Donna Don has taken his poor little newbie and, as I am told it, grabbed her by the back of the doublet and aimed her like a Gatling gun. Fire, fire, fire. Essentially tossing her aside at the point when she finally gets killed. The final blow of the battle, which may or may not have been a legal blow, was him reaching around to slit someone's throat with their dagger while they were busy trying to parry me with my sword. And so somehow we won that. I don't know. It was so weird. No one wanted to give orders. I don't understand. I don't know how that happens. So Nobody came up to gang flags. Is the part that's the, like... Yeah. Get them, Just, It worked! Get them, but, uh, Yeah, so uh, that's my recommendation, is always kill the commander. And I say that, unfortunately, as a commander who has had people put a lot of effort into trying to kill me. Because I'm sadly not a quiet person. Don't kill the commander. We are nice and kind and sweet and Love us. Mm -hmm. Love your commander. All right, I know that we are over, but screw it. It's fun. Um, Peter, uh, your story and... We've got a couple of questions in the Q and A, but if there are any others, you know, please uh, drop one in the chat. Peter. All right. I think my favorite was actually the last time I was on an open field battle at Penzik that wasn't just a giant line fight, and that was also my first time on the battlefield of Penzik. Um, it was Penzik thirty six, and. Uh, we decided we were the, the plan was going to be that we would or wait was it 36 no i'm sorry i, I misspoke it was 38 um so it wasn't my first time but it was a minute ago um chretien fournier was the, was our general and he decided that he wanted to practice hammer and anvil tactics all war season on the on the small unit scale so five to ten person units hammer and anvils all over the place and we were, we were assigned in pairs. This, your unit is a hammer, your unit is an anvil. So if you're an anvil, your job is to run into a group of the, a group of the opposition and just stick to them and let a hammer come in from the side or from behind and kill them. And rumors had gotten across to the Eastern side that we were doing a hammer and anvil something. And their interpretation apparently was that it was half of the army was the hammer half of the army was the anvil. And so the first round they guessed left was the hammer. And we came out and it didn't work for them at all because we broke the fight up into small things and munched them while they were waiting to get overwhelmingly slammed. And the second fight they decided it must have been the other side and it still didn't work. The third time they said, okay, this is dumb that we're just gonna go, which almost worked. Um, and then Christian had two units in reserve. He had, he had um, our, us, the Wednesday company, were really new. And they also ha he also had um, the Brindokan blades as his kind of, he called us his, his shoulder mounted rocket. And to just point us and go, go blow that thing up. Um, and he saw a gap form between Atlantia, who was the East's right flank and the East and sent us through, all seven of us, to zip through a 20-foot gap in the line that had formed kind of diagonally. And we zipped through, and things were not looking great uh, when we got there. But then about half of Atlantia went, wait, there's red tape behind our line. There's organized red tape behind our line. This is a problem. And about half of the kingdom, without coordinating or communicating turned around to come and chase us. And the line that had been doing bad things to us because they all just went squish instead of letting us break them up, just suddenly turned into Swiss cheese and crumbled. And we died horribly. I, I think I got hit by six people at one time. Um, we died horribly and so did Atlantia and it was beautiful. Um, that was probably my favorite episode of situational awareness on the battlefield and how beautifully bad things can go. 
I, I just want to say my favorite part of that story is the lesson that bad intelligence is much, much worse than no intelligence. Yup. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that Chrétien Bang did to our heads too was that it doesn't matter if the other side hears what we're supposed, what we what we say we're going to do. If we do it right, they're just going to know why they died. Mm -hmm. And as we've said previously in this chat, uh, actually, I think it was you, Peter. If we raise all the boats, it's going to make for a much more interesting fight, much more interesting melee. Yep. Um, that doesn't mean maybe rent a billboard in New York City and be like, "This is our plan for Penzig," mm -hmm. although that would be hilarious. But, <laughs> um, so we're going to dive into the Q&A uh, right now. Um, and our first question is actually from Stuart. Uh, and he has stated that kind of earlier in the chat, he referenced that he doesn't, he doesn't want to suicide when he's legged in res battles because his persona is Catholic. And we've touched on this a little bit with talking about um, scenarios that have stories and how to integrate a little bit more play into scenarios. But how can we encourage people to still play the SCA game as well as doing the battle instead of just focusing on winning the, the sport, the melee game itself? Or is there a way to do that? Um, and I'm going to open that up to all the panelists. I'm sorry if you hear a cat. My cat will not stop screaming in the background. Um, I'm going to mute myself, but go. <laughs> um, I know we've done a little bit with it. Um, the town battle at Golf Wars last year is kind of an example where knights and mods were able to cross the river. The, um, the theory as we gave it was knights obviously have horses, they should have a horse. Mods can just walk on water. Um, <laughs> that was the explanation we had. <laughs> Not a great explanation, but that was something that we kind of threw in there of your rank matters in some way. It makes the game slightly different from you. I think it ends up being a personal choice. I think as, I'm gonna call us game makers. I think that's what this panel is. It's a group of people who in some way have influence over what the game is. We have the opportunity to allow it, but I don't know how much I feel like I'd want to force it. I've seen things like duels at dawn where people people are you know, really excited. They researched you know, exactly what a duel would look like. They read the handbook and they organized this whole thing. And I think those things are awesome. I think our job as game makers is to provide a space where that can happen. At the same time, I don't want to force anyone. I mean, with all the love in my heart, I don't want to read a textbook before I fight someone. Okay, well, I do anyway, Never mind. Um, that was a bad example. <laughs> but to offer that opportunity and people do with it what they will. Um, I know my, my usual peer pressure is if you have something like that where you've got this great idea of a scenario with a plot line that's going to have people doing personas, I've said it before, I'll say it again, come to Golf Wars, say you want to, I mean, tell me before you show up, please, so I can put you on the schedule. Tell us what you want to do. And as much as possible, I will be glad to sit there and, and help you run it. I'll provide the name tags. I mean, let me know what you want. And I'll make it happen. And I mean, if your problem, honestly, if your problem is I can't get to golf wars, find me personally, I will find a way to get you to golf wars. Like if your offer is I'm going to run two scenarios at golf wars, heck, I'll start a fundraising, you know, figure out a way to get you there. Like I'm, I'm willing to do this because my, I feel like my job as Armic is to make that war as much fun for as many people as possible. Can I hear the question? Uh, uh, so how can we encourage, <laughs> so the question itself <laughs> is how can we encourage people to play the SCA game as well as the battle um, instead of just focusing on winning the, the melee scenario itself? Is there a way to do that? I, I think I'm mostly with Hawk on that, that in scenario design, every, there's so many, many variants on Persona. I mean, our previous king was a samurai and his consort was a, a Spanish queen. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's not a good way to say, oh, this, per, this battle is all about Persona play. Um, at the same time, I think it's great to model your, um, it's great to model what you want to see on the field and what you want to see in the world. If you think that persona activity and taking what your persona would do really seriously, which I think is awesome, um, 
go out and model that and make it cool, make it awesome. Um, let people tell stories about it so that other people think it's cool and awesome. And that's how, how change happens. Um, legislating change it isn't a great way to play, in my opinion. Um, I think it's a lot better to lead than to force. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it was Seto, um, who most of the time his persona is samurai, but he also did a really amazing 13th, 14th century and now is doing some really awesome Lens Connect. Must be nice to have a tailor. Dude's amazing. <laughs> was, that, was that Stuart Raven that posed yeah. that question? Yes, yes it is. Hi, Stuart. It's a difficult question. He's from Ontario. I've known him for about 20 years. Um, I, I, I'd like to tackle it just a little bit. So I think the real question is, how do we make winning less important than having an SCA experience, having a persona experience, having a development experience? Um, or how do we make winning less important than those parts of it? And I, I think there's a variety of ways you can do that. Um, and, it's, and, and I think one of the ways you can do that is not by making winning less important, but by making the other parts more important. And uh, I, one of my suggestions would be to bring in uh, the, the audience, bring in the people who are watching what's going on and allowing them to have some sort of effect on the outcome of the battle based on what they're seeing. So if you reward behavior that you want to see and allow people other than yourself as the MIC to reward that behavior, you create a system in which people will behave the way you want and the audience will reward them for it. So if uh, a great example of this is, you know, rose tournaments, people are given roses for chivalrous behavior, right? Well, you can do similar things on the battlefield if you give the audience the way to hand out extra lives or uh, uh, improvements of position based on what they see. So if somebody is out there, uh, speaking and rhyming couplets as an example that was given earlier, they can be rewarded by that by members of the audience. They can be given something that will give them an advantage in war. And so in that fashion, I think you can encourage persona development over absolute victory. Yeah, it's bringing in parts of a pot of arms where you have the gallery that can give out favors and, and such to and reward those who do more than just fight but show the essence of their passion and their love and their theater um, and and maybe just uh, as people come off the field dead um, have a set of audience that does that that says you get to live again I, that's brilliant I think that's great right and they give them a rose or they give them a life like you give the audience regens to hand out to people whose performances that they've enjoyed, right? And you tell you talk to them beforehand and you say, look, this battle is all about rhyming couplets. This battle is all about chivalry. This battle is all about whatever. And you, you state those criteria and you let the audience reward. And I think you'll you'll get what you want out of that. And Hawk it totally has her hand up and I'm gonna mute myself now. No, it's um because as you said it I remembered we used to on these tavern brawls um we had an issue in our kingdom where it was all very serious double limb fights. We want, we want to fix that. And my solution when I want to fix something is like, okay, I'm going to do it. And so we had these tavern balls that we weigh on. And one of our rules for making the rules of it was the audience has to be involved in some way. Um, I'll admit that they were more like funny, fun, you know, joke type shot things as opposed to you know, something serious because that was our goal. But we did a, um, a strip fencing tournament where each of the fencers had a proxy stripper and all of the clothing got donated to Gold Key and there were rules about, you know, what your bottom layer had to be. I was going to say, it sounds a little dangerous. We, 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 we put a lot of rules in place to keep this family Trimeris, friendly. Trimeris, man. Trimeris. <laughs> Trimeris. Trimeris. Um, and we handed each of the proxy strippers a mug and gave out dollar bills with the Baroness's face, with her permission, to all of the audience members so that they could tip their person um, it was pins that you were wearing, and when they hit a pin shaped like a shirt, your proxy strip out to, you know, donate that. And I mean, again, it's silly and funny and has a lot of potential for bad things to happen. You know, you're going to have to control it. But if you do, it turns into um, something where someone walks by and they go, what on earth is happening over there? 
and then having stepped over to see what on earth these crazy rapier fighters are doing, they then and have the opportunity to become part of the game. I mean, obviously this isn't very period of a persona, but things like that, where you can, it doesn't, it, it, roses are a great idea, things like that, things where, where you get the audience in there, because it, it does, it, it makes it part of the whole surrounding. Um, I forget who it was, I think it was Oliver who talked about the tournament or, or brawl over the day where, you know, the art side, you know, was what earned you res points, basically, what earned you res resurrections and the target archers, you know, when they did something, that was how you got rid of those and things like that. And so stuff like that, where you just involve as much of the community as you can. And the whole community, the whole kingdom, however you want to phrase that. All, all the mid-realmers are here, like, taking bets on how fast we'd be banished if we tried to run something like that up here. That's not the time we run it, run up here. We do that all the time up here. <laughs> I mean, okay, so we did, we did another one where um, you had a mug of water and um, you could pay water to the devil to resurrect and you could go and beg more water off of audience members of the Baroness. A little less risque. Um, and another one where you were saving animals out of, a, out of a barn and the audience got these hoops of neon orange, really thick rope that they got to toss into the burning, burning barn. And if you stepped on one, your foot got frozen. If you'd stepped through a burned out hole. So again, they're not necessarily specifically period. I mean, it's not probably not what the, the questioner was asking when he wanted persona. But take that, that sort of thing and go, okay, well, how can I come up with a period version of this? What am I going to come up with? You know, Hawk, I don't even know if it has to be period. I think the bottom line is what the question was, how do we encourage a certain type of behavior? You know, okay. how, yeah. do we, how do we move away from this win at all costs behavior? Because my persona, my persona has these, has a different agenda than win at all costs. So how do we allow those people to play their game? And the way you do that is you, 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 you give them conditions in which they can play that way. So yeah, if, exactly. if, if bringing the audience in, allowing them to uh, flower in front of them is, is the way for them to, ha to play the game the way they want to play, then uh, the, the, as you say, that's the way to think about these things. Um, and I think realistically, anything you do outside of last man standing, outside of first person to stick the other person will allow people to explore those types of things. Okay, so I am going to cut that question there. Uh, because that is a really good stopping point. I know that at least one of our panelists has to cut kind of now, but there is another question from the audience um, from Albion, who is a little bit sad to see more RPG hate than love. And um, he just took over Tortuga. He, she, they, they just took over Tortuga, last Penzik. Uh, loves them and would like to include more RPG inclusive scenarios. So as game makers, how can you overcome typical RBG issues? I would love to answer this. <laughs> all right, go it's ahead. Actually, it's already it's actually already been answered twice. So, yeah, you talked uh, about Oliver, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, Oliver talked about uh, the Alamo uh, scenario that he ran, and we do something very similar up here. And it's it's an interesting cultural thing because as an American, I'm assuming you're American, Oliver. You 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 refer to the Alamo. We call it a Zulu war because, of course, as a Canadian, we have a Commonwealth. Uh, we have a Commonwealth background. And so for us, we'd run the exact same scenario where one side has no guns and the other side has all the guns, right? And they're in a defensive position with their guns with, with, a, with a set number of ammo. How long can you survive against an opponent that has unlimited regenerations, but no guns? And so we would play that and then switch sides and do it again. And we would, and people love that game. We would play that uh, as a time scenario. And so the people with the guns, they get to fire their guns a lot. And it's a really, really good time. And it allows the people who brought, who have carbines and rifles and pistols, and they love that stuff, it allows them an opportunity to do that. And so I think that's a really great way to do that. We do that as well. And it sounds like you guys do it too. And the other thing was the convention that I mentioned earlier, I don't know if, if this person heard that, which was if, the problem with RBGs, the people, the reason people hate RBGs is because they're OP, they're overpowered, they unbalanced scenarios. If one side brings 20 RBGs and 300 shot, and the other side has two RBGs and 10 shot, and you allow everything on the field, it's going to suck. So you don't do that. You put rules in place that allow people to enjoy these toys 
rather than hate these toys. And mm. what we do is we just, we say, you can bring as many RBGs as you want, but you're both going to bring the same amount of ammo and you can use it whenever you want, but you can't glean it. So if it's 45 shots a piece, it's 45 shots a piece. Once you shoot it, it stays on the ground. You clean it up after the war is over. Mm -hmm. And in that fashion, your commanders have to decide. I had a scenario where I said, okay, we're going to play this even up RBG thing. And one side said, oh, we have, you know, we have 80 shot. And the other side said, we have five. I knew they didn't have five. I knew they had way more than five, but they said we have five. And so by the rules, it was like both sides had five shots. Guess what? Those five shots were used very judiciously. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you create scenarios where they are actually useful and fun, because fun is always the razor, and if it's not fun, don't do it, then people will enjoy using them again. That's my take on it. I, I know the biggest complaint I hear at home, sorry, Peter, I know you raise your hand. The biggest complaint I hear at home is, uh, especially from a significant other who is a tall mod, is especially non-res battles. RBGs are total no-go because you get geared up, you put on all your toys, you get out there, they see the big white collar and they go pew and you're done for the rest of the day. So that's my take. Peter, I saw your hand raised. Fight with a shield. Yeah. Uh, that's that was my answer when we had the had the no res on the functionally unlimited shot bridge battle i was a commander i was like well okay i'm carrying a shield for this battle um but really i, I agree that the two things if you want to have unlimited shot have unlimited res if you want to have your you're dead you're dead you need to limit shot it needs to be a pretty small number uh, because, and if you think about the time scales that we're looking at and the press that we're looking at in a fight, and you want to apply a tiny little semi-realistic filter on the fight, it's really, really hard to load a wheel lock pistol in the middle of a press. <laughs> it really Yes, hard. yes, exactly. That's why you limit it, right? Yeah. I mean, I can go out on a war field with 50 shots. I can load those suckers fast. You can, you can load and shoot that pistol and throw it behind you and have people loading them yeah. for you. That is not realistic at all, and it, right. it's just complete. And I know this because I've done it, mm -hmm. and it completely unbalances a fight. Yeah, even with just like a, a, a sem, uh, like a Civil War era um, flintlock or cap lock, it takes forever to reload, and it's hard to do it in, a, in, a, in chaos. And then we, how many people shot their their uh, ramrods downrange in every Civil War battle? And so that th we're slapping out ten or fifteen rounds in a minute with a wheel lock pistol that you have to wind up a spring on every time? Well, so the answer is if, other, you um, want to play, if the answer is if you want to play with RBGs, you accept limits on them yeah. to make yep. it fun for all because fun is always the reason. Yeah. Have a non-proliferation treaty. So uh, Albion followed up with a, so then how do you deal with the people who show up to the RBG battle and still complain they got shot? Which will sacrifice, <laughs> right? I was like, uh, neon sign. Yeah. I, Honestly, I mean, you've, you've explained the TRPs, uh, uh, you've explained the rules, the conventions beforehand. If they don't like them, they can go and get a, they can go have a water break. It's going to be over in less than 10 minutes anyway. Here's a black and yellow stick. Have a nice day. Yeah. Well, thank you for marshalling. Yeah. yeah. The thing, we have the same problem both on the rapier and the armored field. Mm -hmm. um, there it's combat archery and the complaints are the same there are four groups that always get shot anybody in shiny armor anybody that is wearing something white anybody that is commanding or anybody that is another archer or rbg person those are your primary targets and yes the knights especially the mods and white scarves especially will get shot a lot mm -hmm. Everybody else is a target of opportunity. Sometimes you get hit by accident. Yeah. So yes, the best way to have a, a lot of, we, I don't, when I do scenarios, not every scenario has RBGs or spears. Those are in certain scenarios, uh, usually with reses or limited reses or certain conditions where you have like a bridge battle where, we, where it becomes actually useful to use those as a force multiplier to be able to break a bridge or break a doorway. Uh, there's a tactical reason to put them in, not just to have them so people can sh have a duck shoot. 
Yeah, bridge battles with missile weapons is exactly that. It's a duck shoot. You have to be really careful. You have to really think about the scenario and what you're going to allow in a bridge battle, because it's 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 not it's not fun, right? Yeah. It's not fun for those people to be shot while they're waiting for their chance. Yeah. So um, I do heavy uh, fighting as well, and I'm an elite combat archer on the heavy field, um, and I can pretty much reach out and kill anybody I want. And so missile weapons, I'll tell you right now, missile weapons are OP. They're OP on any field. And so uh, for me, I actually don't kill the same person over and over again. Why? Because I don't want to ruin their day. Right? And so it's the same thing on the rapier field. When you think about these things, you can very easily ruin someone's day. And that's not what we want to do. So as an MIC, you need to realize that and you need to, you need to, you need to build scenarios that give those people an opportunity to have a good time without ruining somebody's day. And that's a challenge, but it's definitely possible. Did you explain what OP is, Professor? Out of period. Oh, sorry, no. No, no. Oh, it's, overpowered. no overpowered. Overpowered. <laughs> sorry, it's a gaming term. It's overpowered. <laughs> overpowered. Combat archery is overpowered. RBG is overpowered. Do you want to know why combat archery is overpowered? Because we have, uh, on the heavy field, my 30-pound bow with my little crappy little fiberglass shaft I can I can shoot I can I can easily shoot like six or seven of those in a minute, right? And you can't do that with a hundred and twenty pound longbow. <laughs> and the same thing with our RBGs. I can load my RBG super fast. I have a carbine. I have pistols. I can load them super fast. There's no way you could do that in period, right? So they're OP. So you have to deal with that. I can load an RBG with one hand. Because I had an uh, argument with you about I, that one. I have nothing but admiration for that. I don't know. What do you do? You I mean, brace I'm it against gonna, your I'm hip or something? Yeah, I'm going to completely admit, like, it takes me two minutes to do. And it, it involves some yoga. But <laughs> because I had an I'd lost my hand. And somebody's like, you can't load that one hand. And I'm like, you want to bet? Hold on. <laughs> okay, it's loaded. And we're back to the dollar bills. <laughs> and so just to be clear, I have a ton of RBGs. I have muskets, I have carbines, I have pistols, I have duck foots, I have over and unders. I've got probably a thousand shot right over here. And I don't actually use it anymore. Because when I became a real person, I realized that all it did was ruin other people's fun. So you oh. have to you have to manage it. So we're, we're getting a lot of, uh, this week has been awesome because actually every week has been pretty awesome because at the core and at the crux of it, it really is about how to have fun. And this week we're really touching on the empathy aspect of it when you're taking into account other people's fun to build these scenarios and make sure. So it's always kind of interesting seeing the macro with the game design and then seeing the micro with the I don't shoot people multiple times or et cetera. Um, we had a follow-up actually from Pietro from Meridiates. Um, Basically, bridge battles and other battles are, um, with the bottlenecks tend to become very unfun meat grinders. Uh, is there a way to make them more fun? How do you fix that? Plan an exit. Like from a safety point of view, plan an exit. Um, that, that's on my side is, for example, if you have a bridge, make, um, make the hay bales able to, you know, Everyone has a chance of being able to get over the hay bales, emphasize how to safely exit, have enough room in those, you know, in between the bridges that they can get out, that they have a way out. Because I've seen, because especially kill pocket, where the person gets killed and they're kind of stuck in this crap situation where we really don't want them exiting through the enemy's line. That's kind of a dick move. There's not really a safe way to exit through their own line without getting jacked. They can curl up in a ball on the floor and, you know, pray to their mommies. Not really fun. It, it's not a fun situation. So intentionally planning how they're going to exit. Even if it's, we're blocking off this area, exit only, nobody can stand here. And making weirdnesses. Whatever, whatever you have to come up with a, a plan how that's going to look. So, uh, is your, so basically what you're saying, make it safe and it'll be fun. It'll help at least. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, this also helps a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I was about to hop in with that, Peter. I know. Uh, would you like to take that as our panelists? <laughs> well, I mean, it's you can you can tell the difference between a, a, you know, a battle between a unit that knows how to do those fights and a bunch of random random folks who found themselves hitting a wall together. Um, and you can see that 
when a unit knows how to fight together, they know how to let each other out when they're dead. They know how to pressure the line so that it has to flex, mm -hmm. uh, how they can create local overmatch, uh, basically apply more pressure to one spot in the line than it can handle without getting, getting buried. Um, and be able to move things around and not just stand there and go ding, 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 ah, ding, 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 ding squish um, for 45 minutes and not move more than three feet each way. Um, it's not easy, but it's definitely something that the vast majority of, of fencers can learn if they get if they get together with three or four of their friends and practice. Um, but it's like learning how to do a disengage. It's not hard exactly but it's also not easy exactly um, and it takes practice and it takes experience to know when the pressure's right and when you're just setting yourself up to get pezzed um, and unfortunately when you have a bunch of people who like like Alvaro was saying come out for the spring break to the to the war a lot of people don't have those skills so having more people who have more practice to be the rebar in that concrete of your of your line is really helpful I, I know with the command staff we have currently, we use those kill pocket drills um, to knock the rust off our very mm -hmm. first event in February, which is awful. It mm -hmm. is like eating your vegetables, but by the time Golf Wars runs around, we find a couple of those kids at spring break and throw them in our line. And it, it's been effective. It seems to help, but um, there is another follow-up. <laughs> How do you prevent, uh, this is from Simon, how do you prevent or do you all think it's necessary to prevent the common literally run at the enemy line and suicide until we break their kill pocket? Uh, how do you prevent gaming the unlimited res concept? Would a timer on reses or something like that help? Um, don't take the timer on reses. What would you do to fix that? Um, in terms of timer on reses, just because that was the last part, I don't time reses, but I do make sure that I put the res point far enough away that there's, there's a slight staggering because of the distance. Like, if my gate is here, my res point's got to be a good 20, 30 feet away from the gate minimum, because otherwise it's just, press the right tap, press the right tap. Like, you, you get backed up into the res point almost, and that is always a bad, that goes badly. Um, from my experience. So that, that's the extent of what I do in terms of a timer is just, you know, spacing, I mean, you have the thing. Um, if it's safe and it's not causing frustration, I don't consider it a problem. It's when, I mean, Warwick says, the razor blade is fun. If, it ha if I was on the other side, would I want it happening to me or would I just get pissed that I drove 10 hours to have this happen to me? So finding that balance. Um, training, I think, is also the part of it, as, as mentioned, is if you have, if you have trained that there are other ways to break a kill pocket other than just, you know, the suicide, ah, let me jump on your blade. You don't run into that problem. But of course, you know, we, as you said, there is that group of spring breakers um, and, and sometimes crossover fighters who don't, who haven't had the emphasis on no rapier, you can't do body to body contact. You can't just shove each other out of the way. We don't allow that. I've run into that once or twice, but I've had to remind enthusiastic fighters that that was not something that was permitted on the rapier field. Fun killer. Yeah, I think- I, I think am, I'm, I wasn't a kindergarten teacher. I'm sure anyone who's ever, who's ever sat there and had to listen to me explain a battle can find, can, can hear the kindergarten teacher in me. Okay, does everyone hear me? Touch your nose. And it's, it's silly, I realize, and, but it's, it's what works. Uh, make yeah. them all sit crisscross applesauce so they're all sitting there looking at I've you, done, talking I've, to each other, you know, can see and hear you. That's... Yeah, I've, um, I will on that, oh. really unrelated, I will note. She's buffering. Never, ever, ever, if you side separately. No, ah, there, wait, people are moving. You're, oh, you're moving buffering. Again. My back. Never, back. ever what? Buff. You're back. Start again. Uh, never explain a scenario to the two sides separately. Bring them all together in the center of the field. Mm -hmm. Explain it all at once. Mm -hmm. You this will is... never, ever manage to repeat yourself exactly, even if you have a script, because this someone's is... going to ask a question. This is very good and advice. 
Yeah. Always explain it together. The other advice is as long as you can and you try. God, Oliver, I love that. I need one. Um, <laughs> um, as much as possible when you can, I try to have a marshals meeting half hour before the start of a scenario and make sure all my marshals know what the scenario is and they get to sit in in my explanation for the fighters as well. You, so you ever given, you ever given handouts to your marshals? I actually have a whiteboard. Yeah, that's cool. I give handouts. Yeah, I have a, 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 I do give a handout. It's called the, the site booklet. Um, <laughs> that, is, that is my handout. And uh, at Golf Wars, fairly recently, I have a giant whiteboard that has, um, I, I, as a teacher, it's literally, here are the same questions I get asked about every single war point scenario. Is there DFB? What's the will win condition? Is there resurrection? And it's literally a board that says DFB, no. Win condition, kill everyone. Resurrection touch the line, go over the line, touch the point, whatever it is, unlimited, two per person, whatever that is. And that gets put up as soon as one battle ends, I switch it to the next battle. So at least there's a prayer that people have seen it and read it, maybe, if I'm lucky, I don't know. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying. But I literally sit in front of that board for my marshals meeting and we go through the board. Mm -hmm. Again, can you tell? <laughs> I've been on the wrong end of that. I mean, the right end, the very helpful end. <laughs> and it was very useful and it did help prevent a lot of frustration later. Whiteboards are magical. Mm. It, it's literally, I made the world's cheapest whiteboard. You go get shower board at Home Depot and some PVC and you just shove that thing together. They're fairly cheap. Oh, I spent 30 I'm, bucks on it. And that includes a pipe. I should probably ask you this later, but did you say shower board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's what's called shower board. They sell it at Home Depot. Comes in uh, about eight by 10 foot boards. Damn, that's awesome. Whiteboard and then you can really cut expensive. it into no, nice no. little pieces. <laughs> yeah, they will Just absolutely tip. cut it for you. That's, oh, yeah. literally, that's literally pro tip right there. Oh, yeah. Hawk saved me a butt ton of money <laughs> when I was cheap of death <laughs> the drill bar. Yeah, and then I just, I, I cut, I think they're like two by three feet, maybe three by four feet, whatever fit on the PVC I happen to have. Um, I originally tried to like essentially super glue them to the PVC and gave up and literally put this thing together at Golf Wars, grab a, uh, a drill and just, <laughs> ta-da. And my, my headings are written in permanent markers so I don't have to rewrite them. Everything else is in dry erase marker. I bring pretty colors because I can. Um, the other side of the board has the schedule and who, any notes about anything that's changed, like schedule changes or whatever, as well as whoever is the marshal in charge for that day. You know, every time Hawk speaks, I forget what the original question was. <laughs> that's all right. <gasps> well, it was about RPGs, don't you remember? Yeah. Well, it, no, it was, <laughs> so... I, just, I, I also want to caveat that with, I really enjoy when Hawk speaks because I learn a lot of stuff and it's amazing. Oh, yeah. But then I'm like, what was the original question again? The original question. Uh, bottlenecks. It was RPGs to bottlenecks. And we are so out of time. We are almost yeah, we are... an hour <laughs> over. <laughs> I really got to get going. Thank you all for everybody who stayed and listened. Thank you all to our panelists. Uh, Peter, Warwick, Oliver, Hawk. Uh, this has been great. This has been, oh, thank you, Oliver. Same Z's. <laughs> <laughs> We need to make some of those um, on on painted on plywood for the back sides of the fight be signs. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, if you guys could see our our private like moderators chat, you would know that we are absolutely in love with this panel. Thank you guys so much for such an organic, engaging conversation. We hit all of our points, even if we didn't have to explicitly ask the questions we had prepared. And that is so freaking cool. Thank you guys for moderating. Like, <laughs> I've done a couple of this. This was very, very well moderated, legitimately. No pun intended. Bruce's. I really enjoyed myself. All Wistrick. All Wistrick. It's all Wistrick. Yeah. <laughs> but this color commentary. You actually keep this thing on track. Um. <laughs> I learned from the best. Like, um, kudos, legitimately. We will, we will be back in two weeks. Um, we are still putting together that topic, but we're kind of hoping to touch on some like unit uh, training techniques and discussing the difference between an individual fight versus a unit fight. So if you want to join us, same time, 
usually about an hour less. <laughs> We're usually done by now. That's probably my fault. All my stories yeah. are very long. Asleep by now. <laughs> me both, Warwick. It's us. Hey, good I stories are worth telling. Uh, we, you good night. Thank good you, night, everyone, everybody. for coming. Uh, we're going to wrap it here. Wish Drake, make it stop recording, please, yes, for the love of God. <laughs> hey, I miss you guys. Have fun. I miss you all.